This is Liz from People I Think Are Cool, a bi-weekly podcast where I interview my favorite creatives from across the globe. If you're looking for a dose of creative inspiration, then go to peopleithinkarecool.com or subscribe to People I Think Are Cool on iTunes and Stitcher. You like film, from cult to classic, from blockbuster to B-movies. And there just isn't that one place with all the fan fervor and passion that's covering the kind of mad, diverse brilliance that you love. Well, that's where you're wrong. AfterMovieDiner.com is that fan-built movie nirvana just for you, featuring the sweet, sweet writings of the wife dork herself. AfterMovieDiner.com. Go there. Be the best you can be. You guys look like... What do they look like, Jimmy? Dorks. (laughs) <laughs> they look like a couple of dorks. Get those birds! They're coming to get you, Barbara. What are you kidding? We got us a family here. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? You are listening to the In the Mouth of Dorkness podcast, the official podcast of the Alamo Draft House Winchester. Welcome to another edition of the It Modcast podcast. Joining me is Brian Young, the Turtle Dork. Dolomite is my name, and fucking up motherfuckers is my game. All right. And also joining us is Lisa Gullickson, wife Dork. What we have here is one of those testicular standoffs. <laughs> oh. And Brad Gullickson, mouth Dork. Hey, Brad, where are you from? Different places! <laughs> and I'm your host, Darren Smith, the disco dork. I'm just happy to be here. And welcome to another edition of the It Modcast podcast. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is going to be our special Fantastic <laughs> Fest slash Lost Weekend Recap slash fistful celebration. Celebration. Uh, as we look back on the happy times. Yeah. Uh, both of those festivals, monumental festivals, uh, I may, might add, have come and gone, sadly. Uh, and sadly, because life after them. It's hard, right? It it's feels hard. like so long ago. This has been the longest week of my life. Right? It's so weird how that happens. Uh, but as we always do, we 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 don't. We, we look back on these events with fond memories. Uh, it's hard to let them go. So we have to tell you about our favorites from these festivals. And so that's what we're going to do in this particular episode. Uh, I was not able to join my dork comrades in Austin, Texas this year. Uh, instead, I pulled duty over at the wonderful <laughs> Alamo <Dude>. Draft House Winchester. <laughs> I did say duty. <laughs> D-O-O-D-Y. Uh, where we are the official podcast, I might add. Uh, with the lovely Andy Garrison and the Film Club 3, 3.0 family there. Um, so I'll be doing my top five from that fis- uh, that festival, and you dorks will be doing your top five from Fantastic Fest. How was your last weekend? Like, just like I, I know we're going to talk, sell- you know, favorites, but mm-hmm. like just a general overall feel for last weekend this year. Um, my it's 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 funny because this last weekend was, the, and it, you could say this about every last weekend at the time. Um, but this lost weekend was, in fact, the biggest lost weekend we've ever had. Yeah. And, and as Mike Sesnick said there, uh, cryptically, this will be the smallest lost weekend from this point out. So apparently he knows something we don't know. It's going to get larger. Mm. And in what shape or form, I don't know. But I'm very much looking forward to see what that is. Um, but I would say this was the biggest lost weekend that we've had. But for me, uh, ironically, it was the most low-key and laid back uh, last weekend for me. Um, but it was cool because... Was that because we weren't there, Darren? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You missed us? Ultimately, that's what it was. You know, it was, I, was, I was saddened by the absence of you, my, my fellow dorks. Um, but not for nothing, uh, Indy Dork was there, and thank God, because he was able to pick up all of my slack. Uh, he got some interviews um, and some wonderful coverage, and... So he was able to ho- uh, inter- um, introduce our sponsored film because I didn't make it there Thursday night. Um, but yeah, like it, it was, it was good to the fact that I, I had a low key approach allowed me to 
basically view the festival from a stand back and just see how large it had become. And the different, the reason why I say it's the largest is because typically, you know, they would have the very first Lost Weekend, we were always in Theater 5. Right. Right? And we would stay in one theater, you pick your seat, and that's where you were typically for the duration of the festival. Um, and then, uh, I want to say a few festivals ago, it got to the point where Andy started adding the B-side. So he would it would extend the festival into an additional auditorium. Well, now, Lost Weekend has grown up into its own fantastic festival of sorts where you have to... There are uh, films in multiple auditoriums, and you have to pick. Yeah, you I think to pick and choose. Was it three theaters mm. running all the Concurrently, time? Currently, yeah. yeah. And so before you sit in one theater, and you're going to see everything if you can be awake for it, if you can sit, you know, sit there, sit through it. But now, like Fantastic Fest, you have to pick and choose. You know, you, you're going to have to kill your darling. Some things you might have to sacrifice in uh, in light of seeing something else. And so it added. Um, I don't know. It added a, a different element to Lost Weekend that and it's funny because it's not an element that I'm unfamiliar with because I've gone to sure. Fantastic Fest. I know what that's like. But being at Lost Weekend, knowing what that that festival feels like historically compared to now, it's um, it's just an interesting transition uh, in seeing and seeing it, you know, from early inception to it growing this big. I don't know. I, I, I found myself enjoying it because it seemed like hearing the the audience members there pick, you know, what films and talk about what films they're going to go to. I don't know. It, it seemed like they enjoyed that new type of experience for those who had never uh, experienced that before. So I don't know. It, I, I, just, I just like that what Andy has created has grown, and it's What's almost... What's cool to me about that... Mm -hmm. And it's what you experience at Fantastic Fest or Sundance or wherever is you'll come together in a moment like between screenings and you'll be like, oh, what did you just see? Oh, yeah. I just saw First Love. Oh, man, how was First Love? Oh, it was great. What did yeah. you just see? I just saw Greener Grass. It was weird. Yeah. And then, you know, people become champions for movies. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I like that kind of uh, the, the how how that that system, the festival system forces you to become cheerleaders yeah and also what happens is uh because the films and this was i'm speaking about this last week in particular a film would show on a uh at one slot on one day but then there would be another right. showing on another day so after that first showing this the conversation in the lobby that you were just speaking of someone could champion first love and someone who had no intention of seeing it initially could then possibly be persuaded right. to go and, and see and experience it for themselves and come out loving that movie. So I think that that's one of the benefits of having this particular structure. Uh, but yeah, so that was my Lost Weekend experience. I think I'm still going to miss... Like, I, I too love that Lost Weekend is biggering and biggering and biggering. But I'm going to miss the days of all of us being crowded in one theater for three days straight. I, I heard you say that before. Um, I don't know if it was a recording or if it was in oh, person. Oh, I'm 100% sure I've only said three things on this podcast ever. No, so no. If but I'm repeating like, myself. I... Right before I went to the festival, I, I was either listening to a previous episode or it was maybe a, a, a Facebook Live video that you were in and you had mentioned that. And I, I had that in the back of my mind. Once I got to the festival, just remembering what it was like just being in one theater and also feeling like, you know, feeling that nostalgia and feeling and, and feeling like I'm going to miss that, you know, but also the duality of also being excited to see that it's grown beyond it, it can't be contained in one theater anymore. But I, I, I remember you saying that uh, before, Lisa, and I remember like like I said, carrying that sentiment throughout the festival with me and going, yeah, it's cool that we get to go and I'm I'm walking from theater to five over to theater to four, but I just remember just being hunkering down. Yeah. I'm, doing, I'm doing air quotes, hunkering down for the long haul in in our second row seat, you know, for the next three or four days. I, I remember that and I want to miss that feeling. Um. Okay. Now that I got that out of the way. We're going to start with Brian. We're going to do our round robin like we do with Fantastic, uh, like a Fistful, excuse me. By the way, that weekend, I kept, I feel so bad because every time I would do like a post uh, about Lost Weekend, I would <laughs> I would slip up and call it Fantastic Aww. Fest because I had you guys on my mind so much. Um, but we're going to start like we do our Fistful and we're going to go around robin and talk about our top five films uh, of the respective festivals, starting with Brian. 
I'm glad I'm glad my brother is back. Uh, he seemed to have Thank a you. wonderful time in I Austin. I, I, I loved following all of his uh, his social media and um, seeing him have a good time. So I'm curious. I'm curious to know what your top five films were because you seem like you saw quite a bit of stuff and you liked a lot of what you saw. Yeah, I did. I did. And I mean, this festival, I kind of compared to last year with 2018. I think I saw. And that one I only had uh, second half badges, but getting there um, in the what's the name of that line? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Standby. Standby. Standby, Standby line. Um, I saw a lot of films that weekend prior to my badge starting. So last year I saw about 21 films. So I was thinking, oh man, this year I'm gonna see a. Whole. That's a good haul with it, just a second half badge. It, it is. It is. But this year I saw 28. Hmm. So I didn't do. I didn't go too far. I, I kind of. Paced myself a little bit more, took some breaks. Um, yeah, we were able... talking about it. Like, we wanted to not blitz through the festival. We wanted to enjoy not yeah. only the movies, but the conversations. We wanted to have good food, try new places. Yeah. We wanted to meet up with Aisha, you know, and, yeah. and have a con family dinner. And we did all that stuff. Yeah, and, and it was great. It was great to kind of have though, that time to kind of decompress and, like you say, just really try to you know, talk about the films that we saw instead of really trying to blitz through a lot of it and sleep in. I mean, granted, there was some movies that I did miss that I wish I would have saw, especially after the conversation. I think Pelican Blood was a movie that yeah, everybody seemed to have really Blood. enjoy, and I missed out on that one. But it, it felt good to really kind of take my time, and I, I still felt like I got to be able to enjoy everything the festival had to offer. Um, so going into some of the films, uh, my number five is one that we all saw together that we all enjoyed and a director that we're going to follow, uh, Kirill Sokolov, who yes. his name is. Yes. Uh, it is uh, Why Don't You Just Die. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Darren, you would love this movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. You would die. It's yeah. so great. It's, huh. it's really cool. Unlike so, the main character, you would die. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Kevin Dando, who was uh, part of uh, the film club, who was there um, at, at, I was about to say last week, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get confused <laughs> myself, at Fantastic Fest, he saw it on the first leg of the festival, and it wasn't a title or anything that really kind of appealed to me. And yeah, even like when I Russian read it, Russian cinema, yeah, snooze, yeah. Damn. <laughs> and even when I read the description, I was like, yeah, I think I might just skip this one. I'll wait for word of mouth. And then Kevin came out and he said, yeah, man, it's kind of like uh, he described it as the church scene from uh, Kingsman. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn, oh. that <laughs> yeah. is apt, really, yeah. with a capital A, apt, yeah. And um, I was like, oh, shit, okay. So I was like, all right, I'm going to keep this one on my radar for the second half of the festival. So it, it contradicted some of the screenings because it played on the last day during the 5 o'clock block, which was the same time as Parasite. Yep. No. And I'm pretty sure we're going to get to Parasite at some point. Hell yeah. So um, thankfully, Brad, Lisa, you guys invited me to the press screening. Maybe we should not say that, should, on that on the podcast. <laughs> but uh, uh, We're doing it for press reasons like this podcast there we, there we go. exactly so i was able to see it so it freed up that that block <laughs> so i really wanted to check this one out and i'm so glad that i did and like you were saying lisa kevin was apt about the uh description of this along with so much more that this has to offer and i think the one thing that the moderator uh did when she introduced the film she said that it's a um, efficient film from a first time a filmmaker and you can definitely see that on display it doesn't look like a movie that comes from a first time uh, filmmaker and I'll just read the description here it says Andre a detective at the world's most is, is and oh they wrote this wrong on IMDB Come on, what? Guys, don't it. use IMDB you should use um, <laughs> the Fantastic Fest site here ah I'm passing Brian my uh, Laffy Toffee. Okay. Sharing is caring. Brief summary. After agreeing to kill his girlfriend's father, uh, Matt V, Matt v gets, a, gets in way over his head when he arrives at her parents' apartment to learn her dad's a cop. Oh. And so this all takes place pretty <sighs> much almost in real time kind of sort of. And with flashbacks. With, with flashbacks to kind of get a little bit more information of all the characters. So... The father is a cop and a pretty despicable human being. The, the person he has to kill he has is a to cop. Kill. And the movie starts out with him at the door 
with a with hand- Matt Vay at the door. Yeah, with Matt Vay outside the door, like psyching himself, trying to go in to get ready to kill uh, this man. He has a hammer, and he goes in. They have some words. The hammer falls out. He realizes why he's there. There's a bit of a scuffle that's brilliantly shot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then we start to get into the story as to who, like, why his girlfriend wanted her father killed. Wait, so that's the opening scene? That's the opening of the movie. So this is one of those movies where, like, shit shit hits the fan from go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love love those type of movies. If we can continue with the metaphor of shit hitting a fan... (laughs) That, like, feces is fucking everywhere. Yeah. It goes all over the place. Yeah. You're wearing it. Oh. It's in your hair. Oh, man. I mean, it's it, on all of your records and CDs. Shit. It is, like, <laughs> Kevin said it's like the church scene from Kingsman. Yeah. Sure. But, like, the level of violence it's is... so bloody. It's more like the raid. Yeah. And and you could tell... Oh. And, and, spe- and watching the movie, I got so many... Um, I could see so many influences from, like you were saying... Uh, um, um, oh, God. What's Spaghetti the, Western. Spaghetti, what's the... Uh, South Korean cinema. The composer. Uh, oh, Morricone. Morricone. Yeah, Morricone. Yeah, yeah. The name was losing me. Sorry. Morricone. Uh, the Quentin score Tarantino. is awesome in the this movie. The score is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But you could definitely see those influences um, throughout the whole yeah, film. Yeah, Tarantino, Rodriguez, he name-checked. Yeah. I mean... You know, yeah. Noah and Brian, like, I could tell this film must have something to it because Brian is not... He, I'm not saying he's squeamish in like in any negative context, but like Brian like, is not a, a huge fan of like really graphic yeah. violence and stuff like that. So for this movie to have raid level violence, but Brian to still come away championing it mean must mean that there's something and something I there. Say that the violence is is definitely bloody, but and I don't want to say it's cartoony. But there's I there's mean, a just, lot of humor. It's in this extremely film. dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's very it's very dynamic, and I, just the way he uses the camera. There's a certain part where he's chained up in a bathtub, and where we see different perspectives, and how he uses like like the the uh, the, the lock on the handcuffs, and how he it, it's so it's uh, it's it's such a great film. I, there, I absolutely enjoyed it. There is a perfection to the way all of the pieces kind of fit together yeah where um it's one of those where it's just like an onion peeling situation Mm. and each level you go down you're like oh my gosh this could not possibly get crazier but we were lucky because we saw this as a second half film but the director of the film was still there and he talked about how to make a genre film in russia the way he Mm -hmm. the way film is financed in Russia is that you go to the Ministry of the Arts to get money from the government yeah, to make your film. And this is something they're really pushing in Russia because Russia, like many other places, they're mostly just watching American films. Yeah, yeah. And so I think part of what makes this movie so good is that to sell it to the government, he had to have thought through everything so entirely he must have had to create such a perfect package then when it was time to make the film it was like it's it, it even though this is his first film yeah. it's it's like he put the thought in it the kind of thought you would put into your first three films oh absolutely absolutely because the way the story wraps up i mean just looking at it from a script level the way the story wraps up going to the last line of the film and how it brings it mm-hmm. back to the beginning of the movie for that particular character, I just thought it was just brilliant. So it, it was it exhilarating. St- it sticks the landing. Oh, oh yeah, big yeah. It nails it. It's the kind of movie where you just like you finish the movie and you look at your neighbors like, right? Yeah. Right? And I'm so excited. You want to like tell everybody on the planet about this film. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. And again, I, I love first time filmmakers. We're um, going to try to say his name because he was so cool. Yeah. Uh, Brian Kareel did try. Sakala. Sakala. Yeah. Kareel Sakala. Sakala. Yeah. You're hmm. both doing great. And he was at the, um, he was at the closing night party. I wanted to walk up to him and talk to him, but I he would have been freaking thrilled, Brian. Yeah, he would have, he would have, but I was like, ah, oh. but, but yeah, that's a, Absolutely amazing film that I will champion and tell so many people about. Darren, you will love 
this movie. I yeah. can't wait for Darren to see this movie. I know. Movie. So I, I, I can't wait either. Hopefully huh. it'll be on Blu-ray or something. Oh, it doesn't have um, no distribution. distribution, distribution yet. No, here. no, no. no. Yeah. yeah. Shit. I want it. I want it in a theater because it is such a great crowd movie. It is. Hmm. It is. Yeah. So I'll right. say that's my five. I don't know, listeners, if you're paying attention. You hear how the, he just talked about this film, right? And that's his number five. That's the beauty of Fantastic Fest and the caliber of films that they show. <laughs> this this year's that's Fantastic Fest was my favorite in terms of quality, fil- like quality of, of yeah. all the movies. I didn't hmm. really see a film that I truly despised. Hmm. I saw yeah. some disappointments and yeah. I saw some films that didn't quite work for me. Right. But nothing I hated. Yeah, no girls with balls. Yep. Yes. No girls yes. with balls. Yes. Yeah. Still one of my favorite screenings, though. <laughs> wow. That movie's horrible. All right. Uh, Lisa. Yes. <laughs> Firstly, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Secondly, I just need to know what your number five is. My number five mm-hmm. has already been mentioned on this podcast. Perhaps you can guess what it is. It is Pelican Blood. Oh. oh okay. 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 And the reason it was on everybody's lips was because it was amazing. And because um, the director, Katrin Gebbe, mm. G-E-B-B-E, won Best Director oh, shit. at Fantastic right, Fest. Sure. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, very cool. Hmm. It is a drama. It Like, to me, it's not straight up like a... It has supernatural elements, mm. but it's not like a genre film. It oh. is a full-on... G- like dra- family drama hmm. um, about this woman. She's a single mother of one child who's about maybe junior high age, maybe 11 hmm. or 12, uh, that she's adopted and she is ready to adopt a second child. Um, this movie is uh, set in Germany. The director is... From Germany hmm. or Bur- Bulgaria. They're both listed. Germany and Bulgaria. I should have gotten to the bottom of that. This is bad <laughs> podcasting. But um, but because the mother lives in Germany, they won't let single mothers adopt children. So she ends up going to Romania to get her second child. And the second child is another girl who's probably about three or four. And when she first gets the girl to her house... Everything seems fine. The girls are playing together. Um, when she has people over, like, she, you know, she's smiling, she's laughing. But then the girl starts to turn. Oh. And she starts to um, get mean. She starts to tantrum. And uh, the, other, the other parents don't want their kids to play with this daughter anymore. And the mother's trying to get to the bottom of it, and she discovers that her daughter has this traumatic past. Mm. And the chaos that the second daughter is bringing to her life has the people in her life going like, if this doesn't work out, you should, like, if, if this is causing you grief, and if this is harming your other daughter, you should give this second daughter back up. And this mo- so this the story is this fight of this mother going like, this is my daughter, and I'm not going to give her up for anything, and I will try anything to make this right. And there's a parallel storyline of she is a horse trainer, and her job is to get police horses um, trained so that they can h- handle crowd control. Mm. So the way that you train a horse for for being in unpredictable situations is you have you try to um get them it's like exposure therapy like you have them walk on bottles you have them walk with flags in their face and you have the the horse go through all of these trials so that when the actual thing happens they're like ready so you have kind of this parallel storyline going on of her trying to find trying to make trying to integrate this daughter who is unpredictable into her life and trying to get a horse ready to handle a riot Hmm. um and i just think it's so well done Hmm. it was so moving to me i thought that 
in a lot of I've watched a lot of films lately that are trying to handle the ideas of mental illness and trauma and how how people who are traumatized are expected to act and how there's you know how therapeutically they're supposed to be handled and I think that this film does a really amazing job of going like of of making all sides understandable there are no people intending bad things in this film it's just people in the situation that they just don't know how to handle yeah yeah um the act the main actress in this film that who plays the mother is nina haas who is a very well-known actress in germany hmm. and she does an absolutely amazing job playing this mother and the child acting in it is amazing yeah. even the little girl who is playing out this trauma and screaming and throwing tantrums it's it's very it's very it feels very urgent it's very provocative like yeah. you really do feel the drama and the trauma that this girl is going through yeah. um and i highly recommend this movie i'm i'm bummed that none of the other dorks got to see it yeah. do we know if it got distribution i have no idea hmm. That's the only thing about, you know, seeing these wonderful films come out of Fantastic Fest is sometimes it's not always the case that the the, the, the film, the, the particular film will have distribution. Uh, luckily, because of the buzz coming out of Fantastic Fest, it generates it enough that it will get, those, some films get picked up. But then there are some films that have been screened at Fantastic Fest in years prior that still haven't gotten distribution. And that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the bad part. Um, but I hope to be able to check this one out. Um, thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Big B. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you're number five. My number five, uh, is a blend of John Carpenter movies, trauma films. Oh, yeah. Uh, again, uh, I have never, I haven't seen Bliss and I haven't seen his other film, Almost Human, but man, VFW was a total blast. It fulfills the, 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 description of those three worlds coming together in my opinion with the added bonus of a stunning cast of actors that you have adored your entire life uh steven lang plays a vietnam vet who runs the vfw he's the man behind the bar and you know his his regular guests are george went from cheers Yay. david patrick kelly from the warriors william sadler from demon knight yeah. martin cove from Steel Justice or oh, yeah. the Karate Kid, <laughs> um, and and or Rambo or or Rambo, yeah, First Blood Part Two, yeah, uh, and, and you know every night they just find their place at their their way to the VFW. Uh, the world is set in the near future, and it opens up with a title card, kind of like what you would see in Escape from New York, where it's describing how you know the place is going to crap. And there's a drug out on the market uh, called Hype that is transforming its users into maniacs. Mm -hmm. They're referred to as mutants, but they're really just basically like meth heads. Mm -hmm. uh, and one night uh, in the opening of the film, we see uh, a, a girl steal a bag of Hype uh, from the safe of the, the main dealer, Boz. And she flees because Boz has talked her sister into jumping off the roof of a, uh, the building. And that's like the opening sh scene in the film is this woman uh, jumping to her death and exploding in oh. so much blood. Uh, yeah, it's a very splattery movie. Mm. Uh, but similar to Why Don't You Just Die, once it kicks off, once... Sierra McCormick uh, dives into the VFW looking for safety and finds these veterans. Uh, it's a siege film and it's nonstop and the, the performances are delightful. And there's, you know, it is assault on precinct 13 meets escape from New York with a little bit of street trash and wild bunch in there. Mm. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's very, um, you know, run and gun filmmaking. It's not very polished. It doesn't feel like what Brian was saying with uh, "Why don't you just die?" Like where that feels very intricate and every shot is planned out to a T. 
there are some rough edges around VFW, and we did talk to some folks like Kevin Dando, who didn't appreciate the movie as much as uh, uh, we did, yeah. or or Chris Physics did uh, yeah. dig the movie as much as we did. But like to me, it delivers on all the things that I was hoping for, and that cast is so damn watchable. And Stephen Lang is just this brick of a man, yeah. and I, I like. He's so compelling to watch. Mm. And so while some of the gore gags uh, maybe aren't edited to the way you would like, you know, I'll, I'll spoil one example, but, you know, it's a siege film, so they're setting up booby traps and what have you, and there's mm. this one keg that they arm with all these spears. Mm. And you're like, oh, man, I can't wait to see that keg of spears land into a dude. And when it's let off, you want to see the money shot, and you're robbed of that money shot. No. Because Bigos is just... He's he's got to crank this movie out in fifteen days. Yeah, fifteen days. That's Bigos sad. was cranking, and we didn't get our money shot. So <laughs> that happens, Lisa. Uh, I but you know you still get a lot of other cool money shots, yeah. and the 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 characters on top of being like all the actors that you love, I feel like they all get their moment. They all have their scene. You you connect with all of them. And it, it, it delivers on that. It's a very nostalgic movie, hmm. you know, with the John Carpenter score, with the, you know, the visuals. But damn it, like, that's what I want. And I got it. Yeah. I'm feeling very defensive about this movie because I know Kevin Dando and Physics are listening <laughs> and going like, it's not that good. It's great. Yeah, I saw it too and I, I loved it. You liked it, B? Yeah, I liked it a lot. And oh, I think, shit. I don't know, maybe that, that's the one thing about the festival. Like you say, we, we talk about these movies a lot and we champion them, but... And then, like when people see them, whether it's on the second leg of the, of the festival, and we've built it up, we really did build up VFW. <laughs> yeah. And and the fact that, like, especially that night when I saw it, the cast was there. Actually, ran into Will again in the bathroom. William Sadler. Are you and, serious? And Martin Cove. I, Brian is just creeping in the men's room. <laughs> you never told me you met fucking well, yeah. William Sadler in the, in the shitter. And they're small guys. They are. They, Why are you looking down <laughs> when he's doing his business, Brian? No, no, no. I was in line. He was walking out. Uh, okay. And his dick was out. <laughs> no. no, but um, yeah, Stephen Lang. Everybody was there, and it was just a great screening. And yeah. I mean, it has that B movie quality. That grindhouse quality to it that I really, I don't know, I kind of dug it. And like you said, there's a there's a certain camaraderie, a chemistry that all of these guys have together, and you see that on screen, and it's it's so present that even when you're connected to these characters, when certain things happen to them later in the film, you find yourself kind of invested in their stories and and mm -hmm. how they go out, so to speak. No, um, no spoilers, but people die. <laughs> people die. No. But uh, but yeah, it was so much fun. I had I had fun watching the film, man. It was a lot of fun. And and the young guy, Sean Williamson, not related to Fred Williamson. Not related oh, to Fred. Man. Not related to Fred Williamson. He plays like the young Moraine. He's very handsome. Yeah, oh. and I, I, I was talking to him outside um, uh, outside the Alamo, and he was he was mad cool, and we were talking to him for a minute, and he was just saying how much fun it was working with all those guys. So it was cool, man. It was a cool film. Hmm. All right, I, I, I think I, you'll it, dig it. It's number thirteen <laughs> on my list. Okay, yeah, so you saw it too. It's yeah, not a I Lisa was, movie. I wasn't underwhelmed. I wasn't overwhelmed. I was thoroughly whelmed. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I don't think Lisa has any of the nostalgia for any of the things that I mentioned. <laughs> nope. I and, don't. you know, I know films should not just rely on, you know, how they make you feel or how they make you remember the good times of your youth. But VFW. Well, who Talking says they shouldn't? Because should? Kevin Dando and physics, that's who. Uh, okay. Ooh, defensive. Oh. It's so good. But like, it's it's a Fando Fangoria movie mm -hmm. and it delivers on the Fango. Like, it is a gory, bloody, body exploding, head exploding kind of film. Boy, you, you sold me there two times over. Uh, well, I guess there's another one I'm looking forward to. All right. Uh, my number five is um is Harpoon. Yeah. It's a dark comedy, I guess you can describe it. Uh, I'm going to read from, this is from IMDb. Hopefully they worded it better than Brian's description for his movie. Uh, rivalries, dark secrets, and sexual tensions emerge when three best friends find themselves stranded on a yacht in the middle of the ocean, desperate for survival. Yes. Yes, that is like the... GPG <laughs> description of what actually goes down on this boat in the middle of nowhere between these three troubled individuals. Um, this film, this film screen, this was like uh, one of the. I want to say this was like the 
the midnight screening on Friday, and it it was a perfect it was a perfect movie for the that particular crowd like time. It? Oh man, yeah, because it, it that that description is really tame compared to what actually transpires on this. And this is a this is a um this is a lower budget like indie, it's a smaller budget film. Um, but what I it's directed by Rob Grant, and uh, he's also one of the writers. Uh, but what I will say though is, even though it's like a lower budget film, like the cast is only like four. Let me see the it's uh Emily Tyra she plays Sasha, Monroe Chambers plays Jonah, and Christopher Gray plays Richard. Those are the three best friends. So when the movie starts out, they aren't on the boat yet. Something happens between the three friends that kind of put them on. Uh, let's see. There, there's <laughs> tensions. There's there's tensions that's created, and to settle these tensions or ease the tensions or just get rid of them um, altogether, uh, Richard says, hey, to make up for what happened, let's go out on the on my boat, because he's, Richard's the rich, um, the rich, you know, careless best friend, and so he says, all right, hey, let's go out on my boat, we'll make up, I'm apologizing for what I did, because he accuses Jonah of sleeping with Sasha, so they're three childhood friends, they, they grew up together, and they're just, they're, they're cool. Uh, Sasha and Richard are boyfriend and girlfriend, and Jonah is his own, you know, he's doing his own thing. Richard thought that Jonah was sleeping with Sasha, whoops his ass in the opening of the film, and then... It's a great beating. Turns out that, oh, shit, I, I may have overreacted. My bad. Let me make it up to you. We're going to grab some beer. We're going to go out on the boat. We're going to fish, and then we'll smooth things over and work things out. So that happens as far as grabbing the beer, the cooler, getting on the boat. Smoothing things out does not happen. <laughs> Shit goes like super south. Um, but and the way that I, the the thing I liked about the film was the unpredictability of it. Um, I mean, you you kind of know just from the setup, from the poster, from the image that's on the screen before the screening starts. Oh yeah, I'd be remiss if I did not mentioned that prior to the screening, Andy Garrison, at Lost Weekend, he comes in and he introduces these films to the audience, um, and he brings down a sponsor and stuff like that. Depending on the screening, whether it be Yargo's Land, the most lobster, Andy might don a lobster costume and come down there screaming as Butters the lobster. Uh, but when you introduce a movie called Harpoon, and you're Andy Garrison, of course you go get a fucking harpoon, <laughs> a real harpoon, and you introduce the movie oh with a real God. harpoon in the theater. So that was nuts, and that's why I love Andy Garrison. So Hope bless he didn't him. Aiming at nobody. He, bruh. <laughs> <laughs> he was <laughs> now it wasn't prime, okay. but he, he right. was in all of his excitement, he was, <laughs> he was flailing that shit about, and I was <laughs> it was great. <laughs> um anyway, back to the movie. Stuff ramps up, and, and like uh, I would say, the unpredictability of it. That's what I was speaking upon. So you know, uh, obviously, these these three people are going to get on this boat, and something's going to go bad. I mean, that's the whole crux of the movie. But how it escalates, and the turns that it takes, and who is affected by those turns at each turn, did at the very least for me, did not play out in the way that I thought that it would play out. And people who were what I assumed they to be them to be maybe didn't turn out that way and then how it ended didn't play out exactly how I thought it would and I appreciated that a lot and it's and when I say a dark comedy like I mean that like in the truest sense like there's some gnarly there's some gnarly things that happen to people and some gnarly violence in the movie and just the circumstances and how you know you when people get into that um self-preservation mode you know, your friendships can be tested and <laughs> definitely like your humanity can be tested. Um, and it's a very, and you know, as outlandish as some of the situations and the violence and the characters may have been. I mean, if you think about it, like on a, on a, at a very realistic level, when people are deficient of water and food, I mean, that does have a physical and psychological effect on a human being. And like you can start thinking crazy things and doing crazy things, especially when you get into that you know, self-preservation mode. And that's very much in this movie. So it lent some, I don't want to say credibility to, you know, people going, losing their shit in this movie, but it just made it that more, I don't know, it it, it kind of grounds it in a sense. Um, but yeah, I will say that it the performances, which started off as a film, like I said, where I felt like 
not even who I expected people to be and them turning out differently, but also was surprised by characters early on in the film who I felt like, I don't know if I could be hanging out with this character for an hour and a half. Like, by the third act of that film, you know, I was totally invested into, like, all three of these characters and, you know, wondering what was going to happen. And then when things were happening to them, whether I disliked them or liked them, I was still, like, emotionally, like, oh, shit, like, that's crazy. I can't believe that that happened. I still was affected by it. So I think that's a testament to all parties involved, the director, the writer, uh, who is also the director, but then the cast for, you know, bringing these characters and those words and their dialogue to life. So I will say, like, that was that was a pleasant surprise. That was the, the first, um, I'm trying to think, that was on a Friday. Yeah, so that was my first uh, genre picture of sorts because mm -hmm. um, I didn't, unfortunately, I, I missed... Um, the uh, the uh, the Christian Stella, yeah, uh, after midnight, after midnight. Um, but I heard great things about that. So this one was my first little taste of like genre filming, and so it was it was really fun. And and seeing it with that audience, they also responded to it uh, very well. So that helped make it my number five. I caught that at the Chattanooga Film Festival earlier this year. I also really really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was pretty gnarly, man. Uh, hmm. <laughs> All right, uh, I don't want to spoil it, but if you if you see this film, I don't know what the distribution deal is with it, uh, but if it happens to pop up at, a, at an Alamo or uh, at, a, at a cinema somewhere, definitely check it out. And if it shows up on streaming, please support the film, whether it be to rent it or if it's on Netflix or Amazon, definitely check it out. I think you will be pleasantly surprised. Uh, Brian, you're number four. All right, so I'm going to keep chugging along. What uh, movie my... was better than Why Don't You Just Die? Well, I think it's one that we all saw, so I guess I'll be the first one to talk about it. So I just keep going down my list. So my number four is Takashi Miike. Yeah. yeah. First Love. Um, so I guess we can all chime in on this. I'll speak a little bit about it here. So the description I see on, I'm going to go on Wikipedia. It says, uh, Leo, a young boxer, meets Monica, a call girl and an addict uh, who becomes involved in a drug smuggling scheme. Over a night in Tokyo, the two are pursued by corrupt cops, Yakuza, a female Sanson, sent by the Chinese triad. And uh, that seems to pretty much kind of sum up it, yeah, this movie yeah, to a degree. For the most part, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a wild, wild ride. And like I said, it takes place over the course of one night in Tokyo. And we get introduced to the character of Leo, who's this boxer. Um, and then also uh, Monica, the call girl, who's um, staying at this house and they're keeping her drugged up. And she's trying to, you know, she's going through some withdrawals and she's trying to get off of this drug. And then just this this wild and crazy story of uh, just backstabbing and corruption. And the uh, one of the standouts was a character um, who kind of starts the double cross uh, with the corrupt cop, uh, Case is his name, uh, played, I'm going to try to pronounce this, Shota uh, Sumo Sumotani, if I'm saying that right, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who was also the narrator in Tokyo Tribe. That's right, I was about to say that. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, and he was a hoot. Uh, this, so good. This, this movie is a riot from start to finish. And I mean, I know the trailer compared it to Tar like a Tarantino-esque style film. Um, I, it it kind of has some of these outlandish, colorful characters that you're kind of following through this journey. I did not feel Tarantino at not, all. Me neither. No, me not, and not that is really. not a slight against the movie. No, or no the not, not at all. But I just had so much fun, especially with uh, all of us uh, seeing this as the second film of uh, opening night. And um, and this heart at this story with these the main characters of Leo and Monica and how this wraps up towards the end. I think what makes this film such a triumph yeah. is the fact that pretty much everybody dies. Like <laughs> there's so much death, like and so much blood, and it's but it's ultimately a super uplifting, life affirming yeah. film. Yeah. yeah, and I just. Like you said, like that heart, I just, I left the theater just floating on air how wonderful this film really? is. Really? Yeah. If I were to make a comparison to, I wouldn't say this is direction-wise, but story-wise, it's in the same kind of vein as Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking yeah. Barrels, okay. yeah. where it's all of these disparate people 
with their own yeah. objection uh, objectives, but they somehow end up getting tangled into the same place. Uh, and, it, like a comedy of errors. Yeah. Like, yeah. guys. Yeah. Like, just stop what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody is making it worse. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I haven't really been... I've kind of stayed away from Takashi Miike films. Just to, just hearing the conversations that, like, Darren and, and you, Brad, would, would have about some of his films early on in his career um, and just... Like it's some of the talk around some of his films just kind of turned me off with the violence, so I never really delved deep into a lot of his filmography. So I kind of stayed away from him. Did, did you not see Blade the Immortal last I year? Did. I, I did. did. I did. And I talked to Darren a little bit about that, where I, f- I think that in co- in conjunction with First Love feels like probably maybe his most accessible films that he's yeah, made. Yeah. They- there's been a lot of, t- of talk about this film being his most commercial film. Okay. And I think that it, it and it, it, he's kind of going for that, even though he would deny it, because the person he casts as Leo is like a big time, kind of like a heartthrob. Mm-hmm. He's like, um, what's the Twilight Kid's name? Uh, Robert, Robert Pattinson. Pattinson. He's like the Robert Pattinson of Japan. Yeah. Okay. Um, where he's, he was a heartthrob guy. Now he's trying to do like more yeah. serious films. And I think that this is a great entry level Mike yeah. where mm-hmm. you go in. It's, it's a Yakuza film, but it's not as ugly. Mm-hmm. The characters are not as evil. And then if you're like, mm-hmm. okay, you, we get a dip <laughs> of the toe of weirdness towards the end of the film. Don't where spoil it. I'm not going to spoil it, but there is something that happens that is so... Mike. So Mike okay. that you can't deny it. Yeah. Um, but, like, this is a good way to go, like, okay, I'll watch this, then I'll watch Blade of the Immortal, and then I'll just work my way down, and then when I hit the Mike I can't stand, then you're done. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I would love to curate Brian's descent into Mike. Okay. Yeah. Um, he's made like over a hundred films. Uh, he's made, uh, I think, like eighty something okay. films. Brian probably get about five deep, and he's like, "All right, I'm good." No, but like, if you look at his most recent films, like if you look at First Love yeah. and Blade the Immortal, uh, and, and uh, Hari Kiri, Thirteen and, Assassins, and 13 Assassins is another accessible right? one. Yeah, well, I like, think that that Thirteen Assassins would be a great third. I think yeah. I think he is like after eighty some odd films. It, like he has perfected his filmmaking, okay. and if you go back and you watch some of his earlier films, um, there's still masterpieces amongst them. Like you know, like Audition, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, Dead or Alive, mm-hmm. um, uh, 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 Ichi the Killer, mm-hmm. like Happiness but, of the Categories. Mm-hmm. But see, like here's the That's thing: a weird like, one. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily call Happiness mm-hmm. of the Categories um, a masterpiece. I would call it an undeniably unique cinematic experience, but it's a little rougher, right? Right, right. Um, I, I feel like he is now, like, he's just cranking out, like, perfection. Mm. Spoilers. Brad and no, I don't spoil it. got the opportunity to interview oh. Oh. Takashi Miike. You can spoil that. Can spoil that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and one thing that he said was he was not recognized. He wasn't even considered a film director in Japan until he started gaining traction in the U.S. And once his film started bouncing around the U.S. and he was creating this Western interest, that is when Japan has gone back and gone like, okay, this is a, an actual film director. We're going to give, we're going to invest more money in him. We're, we're going to put more responsibilities, give him more accolades and all of that stuff. So I think that that kind of, backwards affirmation he got kind of shaped him into this guy who goes like, well, I'm going to make the movies that I like and people are going, and I'm going to find like-minded pe- people. Like, and it also helped his budgets. Right. It helped his budgets. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like he is not a people pleaser. No, he's never been. Yeah. And, never been. And I think that when we're talking about like him getting the repetitive thing of, making movie after movie after movie after movie like he is honing something that is specifically him yeah which i think is like it's like um it's like uh like sculpture like he's got he had a rock of a talent and 
it's just getting more and more and more into this really clear sculpture that's, of beauty. That's why when people describe this movie as being Tarantino esque, first I don't agree with that. If anything, it's Mike esque. That's that, that's my thing. Like the only yeah. thing you can compare First Love to is other Mike movies, yep. right? Yep. And this is Mike going back and doing a Yakuza film, something he hasn't done in a while. And the only reason he did it is because he was asked by financiers to do it, and he was like, "Well, if I'm going to do a Yakuza film, how would I do it?" And, you know, what more do I have to say about that? And that's where this very unique point of view on First Love comes from because First Love does not feel like past Mike movies, mm. but feels like a Mike movie. Okay. Yep. It's okay. using all of the same, like, vocabulary, like cinematic vocabulary to say something he's Different. never said before. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. it such a crowd pleaser. That, that crowd was amazing watching that film. Yeah, so good. <laughs> All right, uh, Wife Dork, your number four. That rhymes. Oh, man, I got so wrapped up about talking about First Love that I forgot that it was my turn. But I am ready. Um, my number four is Worm. Oh, another good movie. Brian missed that one? Okay, yeah. good. Worm is a coming-of-age story, but it is told. It, it takes place in a slightly altered universe. So when you watch independent genre film... There's like this kind of thing that like bugs me in independent movies, like where it's just quirk for quirk's sake. Hmm. Everybody thinks they're going to be the next David Lynch or Jim Hosking or whatever. And they put just this weird stuff in their movies that's like, but it's somehow just like meaningless. And, okay. and that, and I find that just so irritating. But with Worm, and the alternate universe that they create there, it is extremely quirky. And extremely weird, but the but there's so much meaning behind the weirdness. So wh how this universe is different from our universe is that um, the way sex ed is done oh. is hmm. How do I even describe this? Okay, so the main so the title Worm is the name of the main character. It's spelled. W Y R M. And he is in middle school. And at the beginning of middle school, you're given this collar that's locked onto your neck. And you have to wear that collar everywhere. You have to shower with that collar. Does it explode? You have to wear it on special occasions. It does not, it does not explode. Damn. Exactly. Um, but the way you lose your collar is you get your first kiss. Oh. Oh, I'm already explaining this. Yeah. And Worm is about to graduate middle school, and he is the only kid left no. with his collar on. So, who's going to pop that collar? Exactly. <laughs> so, it's the story of this kid, this quirky kid. He's super into dinosaurs. He has a twin sister who has managed to get her collar off and she is like lording it over him like nobody's beeswax and really, and he's just feeling more and more alienated. Yeah. And like, to me, that is just, it, it's the perfect externalization of how of, we all feel. Of how insecure you are when you're like a sexually budding human being where you, you're like this hormonal time bomb and everybody like feels Can, the right to comment on do it. Do you think we could spoil just like that one image that I want to get tattooed on my body? Oh, Yes, what? I love this. This I'm considering this to be my Halloween so, costume. So like he's got the collar on, right? And it's picture day. And it's picture day at, at, at school. Mm -hmm. And he just doesn't want the collar in his picture. Everyone else got their collar off. He just doesn't want it. So he tries to tamper with it to get it off, but like in a bank, you know, like a bag of cash, when you try to remove it from a bank, oh, it explodes with yeah, a die pack. Yeah. So he's tampering with it and it explodes. Yeah, and so he has die pack he's, all over. He's his got face. blue ink all over his face. It's no. picture day. He didn't get it off. He got a, t you know, someone <laughs> gave him a scolding, and so here he is getting his photo taken with blue ink half down his face, <laughs> the collar on, his dino shirt, and a smile. And I'm like. That's my entire middle school existence in one no. photo. <laughs> it's and high school existence. Let's let's be real. <laughs> I was about to say I had my collar on until senior year. <laughs> I did. Uh, uh, well, are we sharing when we got our no, pop no, collar? No, 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 no. We are not, Lisa. <laughs> um, but 
there is so much texture in this film. It's ultimately, ultimately it's not all about getting his collar popped. But at the end of this film, just to give an emotional spoiler, I guess, I had one of the most genuine cries. And mm. I did a lot of crying. Yeah. I did a lot of crying at Fantastic Fest. But, like, I had a real genuine cry at the end of this movie because I related so hard to some things and I could empathize so largely with other things. Mm. I, I just think that it's just a really beautiful movie. The director is Christopher Winterbauer. Hmm. And it's just, it's a really great film. Yeah, put it on your radar. Yeah. So good. Duly noted. Uh, yes. B, your number four? Uh, my number four was also First Love, the yeah. gay film. Yeah. Um, adored, adored, adored. It's playing at the E Street Cinema right now in Washington, D.C., so get your butt out there if Go you haven't seen see it. it. Uh, so uh, I'll highlight another movie that I loved uh, almost on equal level. It's a documentary. You can actually watch this right now on Amazon. You can rent it for three ninety nine. It's Iron Fists and Kung Fu Kicks yeah. uh, from director Sergei U, or Ui, I, I'm not sure. Uh, because and I'm not, I'm not going to apologize. It's I can't just ever pronounce. I, it's yeah, O-U. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> However you pronounce that, that's how you pronounce it. Uh, and what I loved so much about this documentary, it's co-written with Grady Hendrix, who we've had on the podcast, who writes the Paperbacks from Hell series. He also co-wrote Satanic Panic, which you can also rent right now. Um, and what, what I loved about the film is it tracks the birth of Chinese kung fu films and follows it from its birth into all countries and all genres and how kung fu cinema has influenced so many different styles of films. Mm -hmm. And so it begins as this very detailed documentary like you've seen a million times. I'm sure you've watched Kung Fu Docs, where it just gives you the origins. And of course, you know, it takes us through, you know, the through the 60s and into the 70s, and there's this big chunk all on Bruce Lee. Yeah. But when it gets beyond that element and it starts to, sh like, I almost don't want to spoil it because it goes into obvious areas like how did Kung Fu films influence The Matrix? Mm -hmm. But then it tells you and shows you how it influenced other films and other filmmakers in ways you may not have expected or thought about. Yeah. And I loved that aspect of it. And it, it was a very affirming kind of film, sort of like what Lisa was saying with first love, you go in expecting to go like, Oh, I want to celebrate the stuff that I already love. And then you come out going like the stuff I already love is helping all these other people and all these other art forms. And it's beautiful. And we're all connected. And you know, like I came out really energized from this documentary yeah. and uh, it's the you know it's interviews all the people you wanted to interview. The narration is really well scripted. Uh, it's informative. It's funny. The editing, it, it, like it's a documentary that's edited like, like a Chopsaki that. movie. Yeah. Mm. You know it, it it clips and there are times when you're like heavily breathing towards a documentary because of how it is edited. Yeah. Uh, and I and I I loved that. And, and like weirdly, like I want to, oh, like I'm dying to say, like, and then it goes into these kinds of films, Darren. Oh my God, of course it does. Yeah. But I don't want to tell you because I want you to watch it yourself. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. It was great. I, I I enjoyed the the screening of that, and also like you say, like uh, in the beginning of the documentary, the origins of of kung fu movies, and also how it correlates or relates to. Uh, what was happening in China at the time and yeah. the, the, the everything that was happening in that country and where these movies kind of were birthed from. So going into that, I did talk a little bit about it with you afterwards, but I did feel like they spent a lot of time on Bruce Lee. Yeah, I mean, um, it's like a, probably like 20 minutes. Yeah, it almost felt like it was 30 a, it almost felt like it was a Bruce Lee documentary. Yeah. And I was like, okay, like, are we going to move past and start to talk about... I was like, okay, you're not leaving a lot of time. And there's for... nothing in that section that Darren doesn't know, right? Yeah. Mm. Like, go and listen to our It Mod Spotlight on Bruce Lee. We did five episodes all around Bruce Lee, and we yeah. cover all of that that's in Iron Fist and Kung Fu Kits, Kicks and more. But yeah, I like, I agree, Brian, but yeah. I felt like we got to keep Bruce Lee's legend out there. Yeah. yeah. And this Which does a great sense. job of doing that. Yeah. And I definitely talked to folks who are like, oh man, I got to go see The Big Boss. That movie looked crazy. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it was fascinating to hear, like you said, stuff that, especially us here sitting at this table, know about, but like you were saying when we talked about it, that there's a lot of people who don't know that history. And watching people react to the Chuck Norris-Bruce Lee fight 
in an Alamo Draft House Fantastic Fest theater mm-hmm. was really cool. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, man. yeah. So yeah, it, I, it was definitely a fascinating documentary. I enjoy, I enjoyed that one a lot. Okay, uh, do, does that have distribution? Yeah, it's on Amazon right now. You can rent it. Shut up, really? Yeah, three ninety nine. God damn it! All right. Uh, well, can we get out of here soon? I'm gonna watch <laughs> that. Uh, my number four is a documentary as well. Uh, don't be a dick about it. Oh yeah. Um, it is a it's a funny, um, touching and very interesting look at uh, a family over the course of the summer, and it centers around Matthew and Peter. They're two uh, young teenage boys, and you know, at on the service level and how it's described, it's you know they say it's a hilarious and beautiful portrait of two brothers growing up, uh, pissing each other off, but you know, being a dick to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really is, as you watch the documentary, more than that, right? Peter is on the spectrum. He has autism, if I'm not mistaken, which was awesome because the family, the mom and the son, Peter, and the dad were also in attendance. So we got a good Q&A uh, afterwards with them. Um, and his brother, his brother Matthew, um, so it's, there's like two storylines, sort of. And they're know. locals, right? Yeah, yeah. That's another thing. They live in Chevy Chase, Maryland, yeah. which was really cool. Huh. Um, so over this, over the course of the summer, we get, uh, we get a little glimpse into their life. And so with Peter, his, uh, fixation and fascination is on the show Survivor. Um, the, and for those who don't know, it's a, a reality TV show where you have a team of people who are on this island and they have to do all these tasks and then... At the end of certain episodes, someone gets voted off the island. Did you ever watch Survivor? No, not really. Yeah, neither did I. Did you ever watch Survivor? Second season, that was it. Oh. Yeah, Australia. Well, that was it. Yeah. So <laughs> Peter is, um, I don't want to call him, a, I don't want to say obsessed. He is He is fascinated by the show so much so that every night he, he conducts his own uh, council. So at the end of the, the huh, so cool. the episode where someone gets voted off, they have this council. So he conducts his own mock councils, and it's a it's a it's a routine for him. Like every night, this has to happen, and it's so beautiful because whereas someone on the outside can look at that, you know, whether it be an audience member or whatever, and and kind of laugh at that, and and just you know, man, that's that's crazy or that's absurd or whatever. But it was so beautiful in seeing his family act like it was that's well, you set the table every night before dinner or you clean the table after dinner every night and do the dishes and put the dishes. It was just to, to the family. They they nurtured Peter in that way. Right. And so and it's a it's a very involved process. I mean, he writes down people's names. He puts it in this this bowl and he'll draw the name. He'll go around. He has the torch. I mean, he'll do. The, it's a whole thing. It's a whole production thing. And for him, because that's one of his processes that he goes through, you know, um, as as being someone on the spectrum. Like for, for me, uh, having, you know, having a family member who, like that and seeing another family live with that and support that and how they deal with that and how it affects them and how they in turn affect Peter. Uh, I found that I found that not only interesting but um, familiar and also comforting. And another interesting part of it is Matthew. So who's not? Um, but his parallel storyline is he has a he has a, a innate fear of dogs. And mm-hmm. so the movies the documentary starts out. His mother is trying to help him overcome this fear. So when we first see Matthew one of the first few times he's at the dog park with his mom and there is a fence there. And, you know, so she's working him up to, you know, getting to close to a dog. So what they would do, uh, apparently is frequently, I don't know if it was every day or very often, they would go to this dog park and they would just sit. And when he's ready, he would go up to the fence and then the dogs would come up and you can see he's visibly, you know, nervous and taken aback by it, but you can see him pushing through that and trying to work on that. And so throughout the documentary, he goes up there and it gets to a point where he's like, I can't do this. And so in that, what my takeaway from that is the mother being extremely patient with Matthew, um, understanding, but also she's very, she's very smart and measured in how she chooses to help him, you know, he'll get to a point where he'll say, 
you know, okay, I'm, I'm coming, to, I'm going to stand right here or let's go way over there where there's less dogs uh, because I, it doesn't bother me as much. And she goes, okay, I understand, but we'll do that. But in doing this, this isn't going to, this is going to help you, you know, this isn't getting you to that point where you can get used to anything. So I don't want you to get comfortable here. So we'll do this right now, but I want you to, the next time we're going to go stand closer or we're going to stay longer. So she would, she would be understanding to him, but she would also push him, push him right? But not in a, a, a forceful way that was overwhelming to him. And the, you know, spoiler alert, it doesn't really show it in the documentary, but someone asked about Matthew uh, you know, uh, an update, and he owns a dog now. Whoa! Right, and so just just knowing that was like a huge like payoff. Like you know, it was typically you get that in like a title card. Matthew now is happy, but that wasn't in the doc. But like hearing that, like the audience like cheered, like because you saw him wanting to do that. You saw the mother there with him, being patient with him, and I don't know. So I, I just the dynamic of that family, and and also how Matthew, they his relationship with Peter was no different than a lot of, you know, siblings who are not on the spectrum, right? Matthew viewed Peter just like how, you know, Peter viewed Matthew. And so it wasn't like, it wasn't like um, he he didn't have patience because of Peter's condition of who he was. He If he ran out of patience with Peter, it was just because Peter was just being a dick to him. Like, there'd be moments where Peter would sneak up in Matthew's uh, loft when he would sleep and like turn on a, a, a really loud alarm and just put that <laughs> shit next to his head to wake him up out of bed or, you know, he would just do, and, and, but they would do that to each other. And so, I don't know, I, 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 I like the fact that you got a glimpse into this particular family with their own unique dynamic and how they interacted with each other like how my family does or how the next family may. Um, and so, I don't know, like... It's not, they don't really go into specifically uh, in detail regarding any, you know, Peter's condition or Matthew's, you know, fear of phobia or whatever. It's really just a, here's his family and this is how they deal with their everyday life. And you can draw a parallel to your own if you, if you can or not. Um, but it, at the very least, you can at least empathize with or maybe relate to the, the human, the humanity you know, it, that this family has on display. And so I, I really found it um, enjoyable and fascinating. So that's my number four. Uh, Brian, you're number three. All right, so we keep going down my list. My number three from the festival was our first uh, secret screening, uh, Netflix film coming later this year, starring Eddie Murphy. It is Dolomite yeah. mm. is my name. So good. Uh, Good movie, man. I, this, That's what I keep hearing. Yeah, this this I, I thoroughly enjoyed this film. Craig so. Brewer, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. Craig Brewer, Brewer from uh, Black Snake Moan, Black Snake Moan, Hustle and Hustle and Flow, Flow. Footloose, um, Footloose, which oh, is yeah. a great, is a really good remake. Um, Agreed. Yeah, I, I really like that remake. So uh, Dolomite is my name. Eddie Murphy p- uh, portrays real life legend R- Rudy Ray Moore, a comedy and rap, rap pioneer who proved naysayers wrong when his hilarious, obscene. Kung Fu fighting alter ego Dolomite became a 1970s black exploitation phenomenon. And this movie really ju- just kind of tracks that journey of him bringing the first Dolomite film to the silver screen. Uh, it's really f- uh, kind of a rags to riches type of journey. And the motivation, and the, the, the first the performances from everyone in the cast, I think, were, was remarkable. Eddie Murphy was amazing as Rudy Ray Moore from the moment you see him in that first scene all the way up to the last scene, uh, which I thought was just phenomenal that, that, uh, at the premiere with that kid. And it's just, just awesome. Uh, Wesley Snipes, I had a little issues with cause I wasn't familiar with the character. So Wesley Snipes plays Derville Martin, Derville Martin. And it's it <laughs> for a moment watching the movie. It felt like I was like, okay, he just feels like he's in a different movie. Yeah. And I told, I was telling that to Brad and Brad was like, no, that's how he is. And I was like, oh, okay, then maybe, you know, that was the performance he was going for. That was what was Craig Brewer. And, I think Wesley Snipes is awesome in the movie. He, he's good, but, but like I said, he's a weird, like, he's an alien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's just a fascinating story. And to get to kind of the nuances of Rudy Ray Moore's character and the motivations of his, the relationship he had with his father and how that motivates him 
for success and to get this movie made. And there's a great scene that you said that this would be his Oscar scene um, that they would show at the Oscars that he has. Uh, th- that I just thought was just remarkable. It's a scene by himself, and he's basically talk- talking to his father, but he's basically talking to a picture. And it's I, I just thought it was just phenomenal, absolutely incredible. I also want to highlight... Um, the actress who played Lady Reed, Divine Joy Randolph, who um, has a, a similar type of story um, in in the, in the film um, as Lady Reed when Rudy Ray Moore brings her into the fold to be one of the actresses in her film and how he found her and everything that that uh, their relationship uh, with uh, in the film. But um, yeah, I just I just really took to this movie. I thought it was just really really good, really great performances, a heartwarming story, a great rags to riches story, a do it a, a do it yourself filmmaking type of story. Of like you were saying, it kind of reminds us of you know the things that we are trying to do, just kind of do things on our own and just find success in that, and then also to just kind of be recognized as like one of the pioneers of the black exploitation genre as one of the pioneers of modern-day rap as we see it today. Um, I just thought, you know, it would have been a great film that if he was still alive, you know, would have he would have really been honored by, by this and by Eddie Murphy's performance. So I, I really dug it. All right. Uh, Wife Dork. Yes. Number three. My number three is First Love. Yay. So we've already talked about it. And then... My number six Mm. is Why Don't You Just Die? So we've already (laughs) talked about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go to my number seven, Mm -hmm. um, which is a documentary, and it is Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street. And this was a super awesome screening. Yeah. Because it was also a reuniting of the cast. They were were in attendance? Yeah. Mark Patton was there. Who else was there? I don't have the IMDb up. Kim Myers was there who plays Lisa Weber. And Mm. then Robert Russler was there who plays Ron Grady. Mm. And I had never seen A Nightmare on Elm Street. A Nightmare on Elm Street Mm. 2. Freddy's Revenge. Mm. I had never seen it. I had seen the first Nightmare on Elm Street. I actually am a huge fan of it. I enjoyed it very much. But I think I saw it like last year. Yeah, not too long ago. And so I didn't know anything about Nightmare on Elm Street 2, how it was received, where it was considered in the ranking of overall um, nightmare films. But the, the documentary focuses on Mark Patton, who plays the scream queen or the like object of... Freddy's obsession. The final boy. The final boy Mm -hmm. in this Nightmare on Elm Street film. And apparently, in and amongst horror fandom, it's considered very low in the ranking. Mm -hmm. And people just don't like this film. And part of the reason for some fans is because there are some serious gay vibes between... Freddie and his final boy and it made people uncomfortable Hmm. but some viewers went to see that film and go and went oh my god that's me they recognized in Mark Patton's character themselves for the first time in a horror movie and you get to hear all of these beautiful people tell the story about how, like, whenever they watched, let's use the example of a gay man, like, whenever they watched the film, they never identified with the, you know, the boys running away or, or um, they never identified with the murderer. <laughs> they always identified with that final girl. And now, finally, they had a film where they got to see the final girl. It was just beautiful. But... That film, when it first came out, it was a box office box office success. Mm-hmm. I'm I, I needed like a sip of water or something. I'm losing it. Um, but there was a steep backlash to this movie because of some gay undertones, and there started there started this blame game 
of why this film came across so gay and some of the blame went on Mark Patton. Mark Patton at the time was like a young kid. He had moved to New York on his own. He had done some commercial acting, and, but he was not an actor per se. He, was, he found a manager just based on his pretty boy looks. And they're like, oh, we can certainly put this in, in a package. Mm. But he was also a gay kid in the 80s. Uh, he had a boyfriend that he was living with, but it had to be on the down low. And then uh, AIDS was happening. Mm. And so all of the backlash of the AIDS crisis and homophobia in America got cranked up um, from, like, to me, like, I was very young at the time, but, like, I, f I feel like... Um, AIDS put homosexuality in the for forefront of conversation, and it was always inflammatory. And homophobia in the culture. I mean, yeah. like if you look at all of my kids' films at, at the time, I mean, like there was a lots of lots of homophobia going around, right? And including Nightmare on Elm Street Part Two. There's certainly a lot of homophobic sequences in that film. Absolutely, and Mark, so. Mark is going like, how am I going to um, keep my career going? And they're saying, well, you're going to have to be a character actor now because you're always going to have to play gay. And in the meantime, some of his friends started dying of AIDS. Mm. And um, I don't want to give too much away, but he ends up kind of self-selecting himself out of show business. He just dropped out. And there was another documentary about... The Nightmare on Elm Street as a series that never sleeps again, mm -hmm. never sleeps again, that reached out to him and brought him back into the conversation in a way that he didn't find particularly flattering. He felt like that that documentary kind of presented him as the butt of a joke. Yeah. Um, so that when this team reached out to him, the directors are uh, Roman Ch Chimienti and Tyler Jensen. When they reached out to him, he was very open to tell his story for the first time. And in the meantime, just in the past couple of years, he has started touring and becoming an advocate. First, he was an advocate for anti-bullying. Then he was an advocate for um, AIDS. And now he's become the spokesperson for gay people, gay horror fans. And he's really embraced his relationship with Nightmare on Elm Street. But that... His journey to coming to this place of acceptance and celebration of who he is was a tough row to hoe and a lot to put on this little, like, barely an adult person mm. in the center of this huge, big budget, budget box office success film. Yeah. It's, I, it was like a really wonderful and celebratory screening. And I walked out of that movie going like, well, clearly, you know, the horror fan didn't identify and, you know, like they didn't understand because they'd never had a character in the center of a film that they didn't identify with. And then I watched Nightmare on Elm Street 2 for the first time. <laughs> it is a boring movie. Did there are show, other did problems. Did they show that as well at the they fest? Did. They, did. they did. Okay. But it, like they did a midnight screening, yeah. and Brad and I had like an 8 a.m. Yeah. screening. We had to catch and and an conflict. interview the yeah. next day. Mm -hmm. So we didn't end up watching that midnight screening, and then there was another screening, and there was a conflict. So we, Brad and I just watched it at home. I would have loved to watch it with the crowd just to have that energy, mm. especially because I don't have it nostalgia. It is a, a very strange film within the context of the Nightmare on Elm Street series. I'm rewatching the entire thing now, and it certainly stands out. I think it is boring. And if you are looking for Freddy, it's not an entertaining Freddy movie. And, yeah. you know, Mark Patton's character is a little dull. Uh, to follow because Freddy's barely in that movie. Yeah, because it's a possession story, right? Yeah. Which is what lends to uh, the, the sense of that is, is that it has homosexual uh, undertones. Mm. Freddy is, wants it, to be inside him, and yeah, it is is inside him mm -hmm. and is coming out. So, like, yeah. it does provide a few really cool moments, but I mean, I agree with Lisa. I think it's a pretty dull movie. But it, like, it's. It is a movie that is 
celebrating homophobia, I think, to a certain degree. I think it does both. I think it is homophobic in certain scenes, and I think it is celebratory. Like, I think it is, um, uh, yeah, celebratory uh, in other scenes. It's interesting to watch it I think it's a confused movie. Yeah, it's interesting to watch it through that lens, because it is is confused, and it Mm. is kind of struggling with itself. But I love, like, the... The film is bookended very nicely by starting the movie with people just openly. The documentary. Yeah, the documentary opens with um, horror fans at a convention, like openly shitting on the movie. Oh, it's the gay one. Yeah, and calling it the gay one and stuff like that. But then it ends with all of these people talking about how seeing Mark Patton play Final Boy in this film really changed their lives and really made them helps them feel seen and the documentary allows mark Patton to confront screenwriter david chaskin about his intentions when he made nightmare on elm street 2 and that Mm. is a very uncomfortable and awkward conversation to watch but essential to the documentary Mm. yeah and and for mark Patton to get over the pain of the repercussions of being in that film yeah there there's a lot of the blame game going around who who knew what what whose fault is freddie's revenge and um and i like i'm gonna say like it's not mark Patton's because he was just a kid yeah like so um it was a really wonderful watch the q a after was awesome. i'm going to absolutely cherish mark Patton's husband was in the theater watching the q a and he sat behind us and he was just like bawling during the yeah, entire q a it, it was just awesome very an emotional uh, screening experience one of my favorites from the entire festival Mark Patton is a person who is really believing in his own hero's journey. He, which I think is like a beautiful thing. Like certain people, like it would come across as arrogant, but with him, like. He's embracing being a champion. You know, he's tired of of being the victim and he, you know, at one point he saw himself as a victim and now he goes, no, I'm a soldier. And it's just awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's he's cool. just a he's just a very cool person, and All so right. that was my number seven. Okay, is that is, now? Does what's the? Uh, what's it's the got one? a dish. Uh, I don't. It's it, like, touring it will, right yeah, now. Yeah, it'll be so out. If like you in could, theaters? I don't. I have no idea. Yes, but. it is. It is currently touring. So, um, if you go to screamqueendocumentary.com, mm-hmm. they have all of their dates, and their ga- dates go through um, October. Hopefully it'll come to somewhere like E Street or Angelica. Or I mean, it's like a that. perfect psycho cinema movie for the Alamo Winchester. Get on that, Faye. Yeah, I don't see a yeah. Virginia or DC anywhere on this list. Uh, all right. Well, thank you. That was your number seven. You said yes. All right, be your number. Why won't you die? And f- yes, and then we're all cut up. Okay, so <laughs> be your seven, six, and three. My my three, <laughs> yeah, with a bullet. Uh oh, is Taika Waititi's Jojo Rabbit. All right, it's uh, first time this is popping up on uh, the. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the, everyone is anticipating this movie. It's made uh, quite the conversation on the festival circuit. From it'll, what I hear, wife Thor thinks it's just okay. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be in theaters at the end of the month, October twenty yes. fourth. Um, yeah, we, you know we're we're in the bag for Taika Waititi movies. Yep. Uh, you know we love what we do in the shadows. We love Hunt for the Wilder People. Yep. We love Thor Ragnarok, yep. and we'll love Jojo Rabbit. Mm. Um, for those that don't know, the IMDb plot synopsis is a young boy in Hitler's army finds out his mother is hiding a Jewish girl in their home. That's what's interesting about that IMDb is it doesn't also say that the young boy has an imaginary friend and that imaginary friend is Hitler, played by Taika Waititi. So is the movie essentially what is sold in the trailer? No. It's so much more than what's shown in the trailer. Okay. What's shown as the trailer is like the first 20 minutes of the movie. Okay. So, Brad, can you talk about it without spoiling? Oh, I'm talking about the first trailer. The second trailer shows a little bit more. Oh, I haven't watched that. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to go too much into it, but okay. I really responded to the performances. Mm-hmm. I think uh, young Roman Griffin Davis as Jojo mm-hmm. is phenomenal in the movie. Yeah. Uh, Scarlett Johansson, who I was not so sure about playing the German mother, uh, is outstanding. It's one of my this favorite is her performances. 
best performance. I'm going to say, I really? think this is the best Scarlett Johansson performance. She deserves an Oscar. She is so amazing in this movie. A, really a side good. of her you have never seen. You know, like, hmm. the, the style of humor that is is happening in this film is very watiti ness ish mm -hmm. I don't know. Esque. Like, esque. esque, whatever, mm -hmm. one of those. Um, but, like, it still feels... Um, it... it 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 feels radically different than the humor of those other movies I mentioned. Mm. Like because it's dealing in the context of Nazis I was gonna and, say, like, and this anti hate satire. Yeah. Um. It like it's impossible not to think of the movie and not align it with like Mel Brooks, you know, and the producers. Mm. Uh. And I think it you know it, it plays well with that movie. You know, standing next to that movie. Um. It's uncomfortable, certainly, uh, and all you know, like you know, it is really strange to be laughing uproariously at at Hitler on screen. It's, but it's, it's just not a, Hitler. But it's not Hitler. It's an but it's an approximation. It's a child's approximation of Hitler. Mm -hmm. But and that is a weird experience. Yes. To respond with so many guffaws and to hear everyone around you guffawing. What I love about the movie is how. Hitler changes over the course of the film, the way that the boy sees Hitler over the course of the movie. Um, and I ultimately like the message of the film, uh, specifically a quote that comes at the end of the movie, which I will not spoil. Uh, but I think it is something that I was not expecting to consider after watching this movie. Gosh, it's so hard to talk about. Um, it's... it's it's a movie that is not asking you to identify with a Nazi. It's asking you to identify with a 10-year-old boy who has been sold a bill of goods. Yes, it is that, Lisa. But that 10-year-old boy represents also how humanity as a whole. Well, like, we can use a quote that is in the trailer, right? Sure. So Stephen Merchant plays... A the Nazi, Gestapo. Yeah. The Gestapo, who is going from house to house, shaking, shaking it down. And he goes into the boy's room, and the boy's room is covered in swastikas and pictures of Hitler. And he says something to the effect of, I'm not going to get the quote exactly right, but he's like, it's so nice to see a young boy, you know, with so much fanaticism. And that's what it is. It, like, what he has is a very shallow fanaticism that is not rooted in any, it's not rooted. And so when he starts looking at those ugly roots, he's like, what is this, what is this really about? Yeah. 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 And I, uh, you know, uh, before we move on, I also want to, you know, give a big high five to Sam Rockwell. I was just getting ready to ask like, you, man. He kills it. Like you watch the trailer and you're like, I don't know about this character. But by the end, I'm like, oh, damn. Sam Rockwell and Alfie Allen together oh, yeah, are, really, are really, really wonderful. Rebel Wilson, there's not much to her oh, yeah. character beyond mm. what you've already seen in the trailer. And I guess the same could be said about Stephen Merchant. But there are more layers to be found with Sam Rockwell's character. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. And I thought his performance in the role was, was really fantastic. Mm. And I just, you know, like, I mean, Taika Waititi, you know, he's just one of my go-to masters at this point. Like, yeah. I am... Uh, I, I I cannot imagine him failing in any way, yeah, yeah. uh, because I was really hesitant going into Jojo Rabbit, and man, I was a teary mess by the end. Hmm. Yeah, I think my biggest takeaway is just how we perceive each other and getting past our own perceptions of or prejudices of people, and getting to know people for. But like even. Like I mean, I just do not want to spoil the movie because yeah. it it says something at the end of the film that I think is very important to consider when you're considering your enemy mm. and the the people you find the most despicable. Yeah, I am yeah. thinking about a a different quote. Maybe I don't think you're thinking about what I'm thinking. Okay, about. I'm thinking about a different quote, but it's a quote about how you are charged to look at yourself. And you have to look at yourself and your own opinions and root out your own fanaticism because, because it's your responsibility to make sure that you're not um, 
looking at something at surface value and selling a bunch of bullshit. Hmm. Well, I'm excited to see the film. Uh, I've been hearing nothing but great things. How so? The audience reaction and reception coming confused. out of confused, confused. Yeah? Really? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know, it it was not um, uh, unanimous hmm. uh, across the board by by any means. I, hmm. I, I talked to lots of people who did not key into it at all hmm. but i talked to a lot of folks who did yeah yeah all right well was there uh, hopefully that just bred interesting discussion amongst people yeah for sure for sure uh and you know taika watiti was there and it was one of the weirdest most awkward q and a's uh <laughs> like it was like had has he ever done a q and a but he had just come from toronto and he had done a q and a oh, toronto yeah, yeah. like did he just smoke a big bowl like What's he looked on? very uncomfortable to talk about his own film. Yeah, it was interesting. Mm. I felt sorry for Stephen Merchant, who was like, I don't know what to do with But what was this weird about it weird. is, not to humble brag, but to totally humble brag, to not so humble brag, Brian and I did the red carpet, yeah. and we spoke to him you know, right before that movie, and his answers were very on point, succinct. You know, he had a strong point of view, and mm-hmm. then suddenly, post screening during that Q and A, it was like he didn't want to talk about it at all. Yeah, but part of me thinks that that could have been a bit or an act because we, yeah. we we've seen him yeah. at Hall Age, and he's a showman, and he yeah. knows how to work a crowd. It was weird, and yeah, so a part of me thinks that okay, maybe he was a bit jet lagged, but part of me also thinks a lot of that was part of him. But just it wasn't funny. Like I didn't. I was. I found him. To, I found I, it I awkward. Was, too. I found it super it, awkward. It, it did feel awkward, but I felt like that was intentional on his part. It, it felt that way to me. Well, if it was an intentional thing, then no, thank you, with TT. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. It was just odd because he was around afterwards. Like yeah. he was walking. Like I saw him walking around the lobby. He was outside talking to people and like having a drink and a smoke. And he was he was out. Just doing this, that was like wow. Taika Waititi is his hair is so beautiful. I just want to run my fingers through it. (laughs) Oh, all right. Uh, (laughs) My number three is uh, we are little zombies. Whoa. Uh, yeah. Um, I was surprised because Brad, you had mentioned this film and you did not like the film. Hated it. So you well, you hated the film. So I was I wasn't going in expecting to hate it. I was going in expecting it to maybe not be good because of how much you hated it, <laughs> but I found myself surprised by how much I enjoyed it. Good. We're um, different people. That's We okay. are. Uh, it, the IMDb says a bond is formed when four orphans meet, meet at a crematorium where their parents are being turned into ash and their respective funerals are being held. Soon they decide to turn their anger grief or loss into expression by forming a band the group soon has fans reviews criticisms and social media reputation however seeing that they are left alone in life they push to force their own path and not be followers and is that but the movie has a very i guess abstract way of showing that there are a lot of influences from video game video game culture like old video game culture classic video game culture um anime um old uh japanese cinema and new wave japanese cinema as well and so there are a lot of ideas being presented and at first pass some of those ideas can come across as muddled and the movie is not short in length or at least it doesn't feel like it so i could see how um some people may take issue with that the crowd i don't even remember the crowd's response to the film i want to say i want to say they dug it and i don't even think the auditorium was full at the time i just remember i just remember my response to it i i felt uh i felt like it was to me, it felt like a movie that I would watch like in the 80s, like Bad Manners or something like that, when it was just focused on the perspective of some some orphan kids. And in Bad Manners, that movie was like really like a really oddball, like it was a rated R oddball comedy centered around some um, adolescent like orphans and how they broke out of this really crazy orphanage and ended up going on the run and breaking into this house and taking this this really uppity teenage hostage and just, I don't know, just trying to find a way. I guess it was a coming of age story, but I don't know, for some reason, I just remember really liking that film. And anyway, this movie kind of felt like that, but also like there were other instances and um, elements of the film that I identify with. Uh, Again, going, going back to 
it's um, the influences from video game culture. So there were a lot of shots where, you know, the, the, the characters, I mean, the camera would be overhead and it would mimic, it would directly mimic um, uh, traversal in a RPG, like an 8-bit uh, RPG. And there were graphics and sound design that also lent itself to that. Um, and so I, I, I uh, appreciated all those visual uh, touches uh, from a technical standpoint, but also just what, like the child actors and what they were dealing with as far as um, their emotions and f having, like questioning how they felt in regards to their surprise of not not crying or showing any tears based on, you know, based on the loss of their parents, but then also their parents in relationship to their kids and how that informed their reaction to their deaths and things like that. So, you know, speaking to, and I guess maybe coming from the perspective of me being a father, looking at my relationship to my child and the investment that I put into it so that when I'm no longer here, what, what impression, what, personal legacy am I leaving to see it? Like, how will she remember me? And so every effort is made on my part to ensure that when she's gone and she's mourning me or she's telling people about me, she's doing it with a tearful smile. She's just, she's speaking highly of me because I did everything that I could to let her know that I was present in her life and that I loved her. And so these children didn't have that. And so how that affected them and their outlook on life and themselves and each other uh, was something that I found interesting, and, and so I don't know, um, but I I, I I I enjoyed it. And they and there's you know they when they first uh, the first signs of them becoming a band, they just scrounge up some stuff together and they start playing this music and they start singing. And their singing isn't <laughs> it's so funny because the singing isn't good in my opinion. Like <laughs> for child singing by child singing standards, it isn't it really it's, it sounds really rough. It's supposed to be like punk rock I it's think. supposed to be punk rock but it, it, it genuinely felt like people who it felt like kids who stumbled upon this particular um t uh, form of expression not having any history with it but still finding joy and happiness in it so it's kind of like me like i know i don't sound good but when i'm in the shower and i <laughs> sing it feels good to me like it, it it feels good to be able to you know get that emotion out without having any type of self-conscious about how I sound in someone else's ears and, and how I would look in their eyes. And if and I got that from when they were singing. And I'm not saying that that's how, that's what the director was going for. But just for me, I found the charm in that and just, you know, not having any formal training, not actually being good at it, but still allowing myself to express myself and finding joy in that. And it's, for their music sounded like that, like just the way that their quality of singing it didn't sound good, but it sounded like <laughs> it sounded joyful. It felt like they were enjoying it. So I don't know. I, I just really I found myself enjoying that film. So you're that, not alone. Like I, I was watching you guys rate everything from Letterbox from afar, and lots of people really liked the film. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's it's so funny. But like I said, I can't remember. I, I it's like I totally blanked out everyone's reaction to that film. I just remember like clapping at the end. Um, but that's my number three. Brian, your number two. Did you already say you said first love was your number four? Cool. Yeah. What's so, your number? Um, I'm just gonna keep. No one has brought this one up, so oh. I've, I've been going down my list. Um, so my number two from the festival was Parasite. Oh. <laughs> uh -oh. What? Something was better than Parasite? Well, my number one's already been said. Oh, spoiler alert! Oh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess I guess I'm the first to talk about Parasite, but I won't talk about it long because this is a movie that the less said about the movie, the better. But I will say that this is Bong Joon Ho, who is he's done it in his other films, and he's exploring classism and social structure, mm -hmm. and I like the approach that he's taking with this film, from looking at it from both sides of the rich and the poor um, and how that converges um, into that amazing third act. It's um, it's a movie that stays with you. It's a mm. movie that I still am thinking about. And I talked to Darren a little bit about this since I've been back and talking about Bong Joon-ho and his filmography. Um, 
I had I've been kind of lukewarm on some of his. Films. I admire his filmmaker. He's a brilliant, brilliant filmmaker. But I don't find myself revisiting a lot of his films. And I think um, two of his films I haven't seen: Memories of Murder and Mother oh are the two I haven't seen. But Snowpiercer, o- Ocha, I was lukewarm on. Snowpiercer, I liked. But I haven't gone back to revisit it. But the host, up until this point, I think for me, the host and Parasite are probably my two favorite films of his. Now, I want to go back and see those other two films to complete his filmography and any, anything else that he's done. Cause he's Apparently, the serial killer who inspired Memories of Murder has been arrested finally. Oh, oh wow. shit. Like, they just figured out who that guy was. Huh. That's cool. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm uh I'm I'm all in on this film. I just think the filmmaking, like the the architecture of that house and how that's mm-hmm. used in the film. And Let's be super super vague yeah, yeah, about yeah. this. Oh yeah, I, I just saying, yeah, I just I love went, that. I went into this film knowing nothing. Yeah. And that is the way to watch this movie. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Especially with the title being Parasite. Because I'm going like, oh no, I'm not going to like this movie because parasites are bad. Yeah. But I love this film. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely, yeah. The less said, the better. It's a good film. The <laughs> cast, amazing. Yeah. Great. They all do things that are mysterious to you mm-hmm. very well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Everything about the film. Okay. Yeah. Score. <laughs> Score was good. Yeah, it's, yeah. There's nothing wrong with the movie, Darren. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it, it's funny. It's like it, it, it's a movie where you're just very precious about how the narrative is is delivered on its audience. I was um, spoilers. This was no, also on not, my list. Not spoil. Oh, oh yeah. spoilers for my opinions. List. Not for the plot mm. of Parasite. Not for the plot mm. of Parasite. Uh, um, I was preparing to talk about this for my list, but you have rescued me. I don't have to. <laughs> and so I went on to the. Um, IMDP page to see if okay because I didn't want to risk trying to do, give a plot summary myself and I was like oh nope the plot summary on IMDB gives too much better look at the Fantastic Fest site oh. oh nope the s- summary on Fantastic Fest even the brief summary at the top says Spoiler. too much I ain't okay I'm stay says I gotta stay much. away from anything written about Parasite when I, I watched the trailer I didn't read any of the subtitles because that's how I watch foreign film trailers yeah. is I just look at the images yeah because I don't want any plots spoiled for me um and and it was from what I saw in the trailer visually I'm watching the movie I'm like oh yeah this is playing out what I thought it was thought it was thought it was and then it's like oh no no what no 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 whoa <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's a real, it's a real boggler. Hmm. Okay. All right. Damn it. Okay. 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 I can't wait to see it. It's still, it's still my most anticipated film of the the fall, so I'm looking forward to. It. All right. Uh, wife door. Your number two. My number two is Parasite. Yay. <laughs> so my number, I'm guess I'm going to do my number eight. Mm-hmm. So my number eight is the True Adventures of Wolf Boy. Hmm. So this is a film from the United States. It's about a kid who has hypertrichosis. Can you guess what that is? Hypertrichosis? So you think trichosis? Or you, um, he, uh, hyper means there is a lot of, of it. Um, and then trichosis. Osis is like the, the I'm just going to tell you. Hypertrichosis okay. is um, he grows excess hair. hair. So he's. Have you seen body. those? Like, it, like if you've ever looked at the Guinness Book. Yeah, of, I've seen the people. Yeah, people. Yeah, with yeah. The, yeah, yeah. So he looks like a little wolf boy, Aww. and um, he is kind of middle school aged once mm. again, and his dad wants to send him to a school where all of the kids have some kind of disorder or deformity that makes them stand out. Mm. Because, you know, he doesn't, his, he's, the kid has suffered a lot of bullying. He refuses to go out of the house without wearing um, a, a snow mask. Mm. And his dad wants to give him a shot at feeling normal. And so he goes, hey, he shows him the video of this school. And the kid is like, I, I don't want to go to that school. Mm. And the, the dad is like, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm just going to pull a dad on this one and go say, like, you have to. So um, the kid runs away, and mm. he 
makes some friends and he learns about himself. Hmm. I don't want to give too much away. Okay. But um, the director is um, Martin Krejci. Mm-hmm. Um, the writer is Olivia Dufo or Dufault. Um, but some of the there are actors in this movie that you will recognize. Um, so, for example, there is John Turturro. Oh. Play so. Um, one of the first places that the kid runs is to a traveling carnival, and John Turturro plays Mr. Silk. The guy who owns the carnival. And when a carnival, an old school carnival guy, sees a boy that is completely covered in hair, what's the first thing he thinks of doing? So he's kind of a villain. Mm. Um, Then uh, Chloe Sevigny is in this movie. Mm. The kid is an actor, but but of course, because this is an independent film, the cast on IMDb is in a bonkers order. And I can't remember the name of the child. Uh, oh, and the, uh, the guy from uh, Fences. I think he got oh, yeah. it's the guy from... Stephen McKinley Henderson? Yeah. Is it yeah, that guy? Yeah, from It and uh, Knives Out. Yeah, he plays hmm. kind of a revelatory character. Okay. Is the kid's name Paul? Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. the kid from It and uh oh. Yeah, Jaden Martell. Yeah. George? Georgie? Yes. No, not Georgie. No. Bill. 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 Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Did you see the trailer for this movie? I don't know. This movie, it, this sounds like it's gonna make me cry. It sounds like I'm gonna cry. It's a beautiful movie. Yeah. Um, of course, one of his friends that he finds is a person who's on the LGBT spectrum, yeah. and they bond as outsiders, and that's very revelatory. It's it's a beautiful movie. It is a it's a tearjerker. Okay. But I, but it's a tearjerker, and yeah. I really enjoyed it. Okay. And it's my number eight. And you said this is American, so this is probably gonna get picked up. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, B, your number two. My number two is Parasite. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's a masterpiece. Mm. Uh, what can I say that hasn't already been said? Uh, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I agree with Brian. It is uh, my favorite film from Bong Joon Ho. Uh, I think it is actually many steps ahead of any of his other movies. And I like his other movies, but I think this is just like. A masterpiece, a masterpiece. It's so damn good. Um, have you yeah. seen Mother yet? Uh, I have seen Mother, and I have seen. I've now seen Memories of Murder, mm. and I I like both of those two. Before this, I'm with Brian. The host was my favorite. Yeah, I didn't really like Snowpiercer. Mm. Uh, I was really disappointed by Snowpiercer. Actually, mm. uh, I, I thought Okja was extremely compelling. But not necessarily my bag, right? Yeah. I really uh, liked Okja. I know you loved Okja. <laughs> I did. But like Parasite's better than Okja. Like, oh hell yeah! Like, mm. like Parasite, Parasite. You're just like, oh man. Well, this it, is this is. I can't say it. It's so good. There are crossover themes from Snowpiercer to Okja to Parasite. Oh I, oh, and to the host. I haven't seen the host. Yeah. I'm only talking about the yeah, ones yeah, I've yeah, seen. Yeah. So he's. Dancing around this subject yeah. in a way that is really intriguing and complete. And it would make a great double feature with another one of my favorite films of this year, which I won't mention because it would spoil something or maybe a little bit. God damn it. Oh, okay. But yeah, anyway. Yeah. So I don't want to talk anymore about Parasite. Okay. I wanted... He did get a plaque. Oh, that's bon, right. Bong Joon Ho did bon get Joon a plaque. Ho. Not only did he get a plaque, he got the theater. theater. The South the Lamar theater. has been rechristened the Bong Joon Ho cinema. That's freaking yeah, yeah. crazy. So cool. That's dope. Very cool. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, awesome. So cool. So the the other movie I want to just highlight, um, it, it didn't even make my top 10, but I keep thinking about this damn movie. Uh, Brian and I saw it together. It was Jalakuda. Oh. Which is the Indian film, <laughs> which was sold to us so unfairly. Yeah. I'm going to sell it to Darren using the same comparisons. Yeah, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. You know, we all love telling people like, you got to see this movie because it's X plus Y plus Z. Yeah. And the X plus Y plus Z that they sold Jalakuda on was, it's Jaws meets 2001: A Space Odyssey meets Mad Max: Fury Road. Oh. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> Huh? <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah. And guess what? It's not that. Oh, uh, damn it. <laughs> but the last 15 minutes is Are? that. I really? would say the last 15 minutes is a really weird combination of yeah. those three ideas and those three films and those three movie, uh, uh, filmmakers. But 
the, the, the basic premise of Jalakuda is that a bull, um, no, a buffalo, yeah. has gotten free from its uh, farmer, from its master, and is tearing through this Indian village and causing mass chaos. And all the men of the village have gathered to go hunt down that bull. And it just gets crazier and crazier and crazier. And like the first 15 minutes of this movie, you are so into it because... The, the editing style, mm. uh, uh, again, is like, you know, it's chop, 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 your brain, you're falling into a headache because it's cutting so fast and it, the way it's cut with the music. Yeah. You're like, this is, this is so intense and the bull hasn't even escaped yet. The <laughs> buffalo. Yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's amazing. The problem with the movie for me is that it's uh, an hour and a half and it really should be 80 minutes. If the movie was 80 minutes, this would be one of my favorite films of the festival. Yeah. But there is a middle chunk of this film where they still haven't caught the buffalo bull. What? what, what? It's a buffalo. Buffalo, buffalo. They still haven't caught the buffalo. And you're just like, oh my gosh, Like, when are they going to catch this buffalo? Yeah, and it's like somebody getting married yeah. and they go to all these different subplots. Yeah. And, it's like, and, and, and it was hard for me to, to, to track some of the characters. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious to watch it again. But when it gets to its ending... <laughs> the visuals of its ending are so mind blowing. Like, I would watch this ending on repeat for the rest of my life. Like, are it, people getting destroyed by the buffalo? Uh, not no, necessarily not that. Necessarily that, but not not necessarily that. But it just goes to some crazy places visually. That like the last 15, 20 minutes is like, there. There is a human dog pile in this movie. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that, that opening though, though, that first five minutes and the way that they use the sound effects and the editing, that's the best opening I saw at Fanta. At, at it's Fantastic so good. Yeah, it like, was, yeah. Like all the way up to that title card. And it's just like that five minutes sells you on the movie. But then that's then the rest happens until the end. I'm like, oh. I mean, like when the <laughs> Buffalo first gets out, there's a lot of comedy around it. And a lot, a lot of people like who's to blame and yeah. who's going to get the, like once the Buffalo's captured, who owns the rights to that buffalo meat and all the, all this stuff? Like uh -huh. it's all very interesting, but it like but it, but it's more drama than Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, not yeah. that there's not drama in Mad Max Fury Road. I don't yeah. want to underscore yeah. it. Don't besmirch the yeah. sacred I wouldn't, name. I wouldn't. Yeah. But the the director yeah. is uh, Ligio Jose mm -hmm. uh, Palisari, mm -hmm. and apparently he's got a few movies on Netflix on Amazon Prime. One's called Double Barrel. I, w I want to check that movie out. I'd be curious to watch his other films. And this film, uh, because of his relationships with streaming services in the States, probably will find its way on there. And I'd be like, Darren, you got to watch this film. You're not going to fall in love with it. It's not going to be one of your favorite movies of the year. But you need to watch it just for that ending. <laughs> okay, I'm looking forward to it just for that ending. Y'all yep. sold me. Well, in the beginning, Brian just sold me in the beginning. Yeah. And the beginning is really good, too. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. All right, so, I'll be looking out for that. Chalakuda. Chalakuda. Uh, my number two, this is a toss-up between this and my number one, and I don't know, just depending on the day you ask me. But as of right now, it's going to be my number two. Uh, it's a little film called Afterlife. Oh um, yeah, that looked interesting. Oh, yeah, I yeah. this was one of those. I was I was going to skip this movie. I I I feel shamed in that. Like I kind of forced myself to watch it, like to stay for this screening. I would have been so disappointed had I not and then heard about this film. So um, there's a 14-year-old girl named Sam. And uh, so this, this is one of the synopses. Uh, in the afterlife, Sam encounters her dead mother and tries to find a way to bring them both back to the real world. So that's in the movie, yes. Um, Sam is, a, she's a really smart 14-year-old girl. Uh, when we first meet her, her mother has died in a sort of freak accident, and she is raising her two siblings, her two younger brothers, and helping out her dad. And she's she's not happy. She she misses her mother. And um, early in the film, something happens, and she there's a tragic accident, and she dies. She gets hit by a truck. It's not really a spoiler. Uh, she gets hit by a truck, and she dies. One of the reasons why I love this movie so much and why it's my number two is because once she dies, the representation of the afterlife in the film I found extremely fascinating, right? She's greeted by this angel and he takes you to, so there's an in-processing. You, you die, you know, she has the accident, 
she the next thing you know we cut to her sitting at a desk in this office and this angel was going through the books and you know trying to explain okay don't freak out i just want to let you know right up front you dead you're dead okay so i'd like to get that part out of the way because it makes everything else go smoothly so once you accept that we can move on and i can get you acclimated to what the rest of your existence is going to be and so she's like wait what the fuck what's going on and so he tells her you know you, you've passed away and but based on you know what i'm seeing here you know you you have two options you can be reincarnated it's two doors you can go through this door you can be reincarnated or you can stay here and go further into the afterlife go through the in processing and so if you do she initially chooses okay i don't want to i don't want to start over um because he explains to her if you start over typically what happens is you take you start over with some memory of your previous life you know there's a line in there about like it's believed that babies have knowledge of their reincarnation and their previous life and as they get older and learn new things they lose recollection of the previous life so that plays a key element into the plot moving forward so she chooses i don't want to go back and start over because my mother is dead you know, she remember she knows that she was in a very unhappy place, you know, uh, prior to her passing. Um, her dad is just focused on whatever he's focused on, doesn't really, you know, she doesn't feel like he sees her or whatever. And so she's like, all right, I'll just choose to go with the afterlife. And then she she meets up with her mom. And it's like uh her mom, when she meets up with her mom, she's brought to like this apartment big condo and they're having like this this get together of all her great uncles, her great grandfather, like everyone in her life in her family that has passed, her her friend, her neighbor, her mom's friend, they're all there and everyone's just in good spirits. They're just they they're gathering for this friends get together evening or whatever. And so um you know, she's meeting her her great grandmother, who uh, Sam probably didn't remember because she was so young when her great grandmother passed. So her great grandmother's like, "Oh my God, this is Sam," and it's like a good, it's just like a reunion of sorts. And if she chooses to live out the rest of her existence in this way, it would just be like, you know, all your troubles are gone. You're just around all your loved ones that you you know that you've lost, right? And so there's a stipulation: someone comes to the party and speaks to her mom, uh, and things kind of things kind of change. So basically it's brought up to Sam that, you know, there's a there's like a loophole where some people die before their time and you can go back. And so, but if you do, like you have to go through like this, you know, this back channel to do that. And so Sam is basically told by her mother and her friend, look, this is too this is too soon for you. You you died too young. Like we're gonna get you out of here so you can go live out the rest of your life. And so that with the knowledge that when you go back, you initially have retained information from your previous life, Sam is going to, she's going to try to remember the fact, she's going to try to remember how her mom died and go through her life again and prevent that death from happening. But, cause, but when you go back, you go back from the beginning. So you, when she goes back, she's coming out of her mother from the birth canal like she's being born again she starts mm. from the beginning and she's repeating she's repeating this thing i don't want to spoil it. she's repeating this thing over and over so from the time she's 14 year old sam the, the guardian angel says all right get in this this dryer this washing this dryer i'm going to cut it on and it's going to it's the portal it's the portal that brings <laughs> you back so as she's getting in it she's repeating this thing that she has to remember to do to prevent her mom's death so you hear her repeating it over and over and over. And then she gets born and you see the white light and you see the, the delivery room. And she's like, oh, my God, what is this? I'm, there's my mom. There's dad. And she's repeating. Oh, what was I supposed to remember? Oh, yeah. She's repeating this thing over and over and over. And then you flash forward a few years when she's like a, 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 a toddler and she's learning new things. But she's repeating over and over and over. Then she's like school age, middle school, and she's in class. And she's drawing pictures of this thing that she's repeating. But then you start to see less repetition of that thing. And she's starting to lose that ideal. And then things happen that kind of try to make her focus and remember what your what your mission is. Because if you if she forgets, she's not going to stop it. And it's just going to happen. Uh, that's all I'll say. I'll stop right there. But where that story goes with mm. that and just how it's depicted, the, the, the world building of the afterlife and how 
representatives of that afterlife play into her her life and her reincarnation and her as a character and where Sam goes as a character I just I was floored by how engaging and how moving it was and so I I it was it was like it was one of those movies like you know the the thing when you go to the festival the festival magic where it's it's, it's totally not on your radar you don't know anything about it you might not even want to see it but then you see it and you can't imagine not having seen it like it is really good and so I don't know I, I can't it's it's almost like Parasite in that you can't talk about it without spoiling it, but you don't dare spoil it uh, for the viewer who the uninitiated. So that's my number two. Um, if you get a chance to see it, I want to say it is the directorial debut of the director, uh, Willem Bosch. Maybe not. It is not. He's directed one other thing. Um, but it is a very good film. Please check it out if you get a chance. Uh, Brian, your number one. Has it, it's already been spoken of, right? Yeah, yeah, it's Jojo Rabbit. Jojo yeah. Rabbit. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit. I was debating if I wanted to go to the... to the. That's my number one, Brian. Okay. What? The Jindy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Thanks so for I'll, spoiling I'll say, it. Oh. oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Now I feel bad. No, don't well, feel bad. You no, could just say, you could rewind, say, rewind that part. No, it's this too late. You could just say that. Jojo Rabbit's your number one, and then when he talks about his, you could just chime in. Um. Okay. Well, all right. Because um, we're pushing like two hours right now. Anyway. Okay. So my number one is, well, it's outside of my list, but the one I'm going to talk about is Deer Skin. Um, this cool. is oh, a movie man. That just surprised me. Oh, and yeah. I just, we I missed keep, this I one. I keep thinking I'm about so mad I missed this. I keep thinking about this movie. Deer man. Skin? Deer Skin. So, one word by the way. Oh. Yeah. And so this is a movie that would not be typically for me. It's directed by Quentin DePier. Oh. Right? Um, the yeah. guy who made Rubber, yeah. which I am not a fan of. I what? Do not like the movie's great. <laughs> blow up. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I do not like that brand of humor. Mm. Like that, I know he did wrong. wrong. And, you don't. Um, you're not a surrealist guy. You no. Know, but <laughs> for whatever reason, Deer Skin, which kind of falls into that same type of film, that same type of comedy, I love this movie. This movie stars um, John Dujardin from The Artist and Wolf of Wall Street. Oh. And um, I'm so mad I missed this. And uh, so he gets. He was a Swiss banker guy in Wolf of Wall yeah, Street. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so he gets this deerskin jacket, and it start. He becomes obsessed over this deerskin <laughs> jacket, and he starts to he starts to hear the jacket talking to him, and I guess the deerskin jacket is getting kind of jealous, or so he tells him that okay, you have to rid the world of all other jackets. <laughs> so he <laughs> does, and it takes him into this life of like crime and mayhem. And uh, it goes on a bit of a killing spree. <laughs> and he, so it's almost like, it, it's kind of like, um, I don't want to say uh, Summer of Sam, where it's like, he's <laughs> he's hearing like, uh-huh. so like <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's almost like the jacket is talking to him. And it just, it goes so left field with some of the violence, but it's so fucking good. And it's weirdly like a love letter to filmmaking. And it's it's I, such uh, an odd film. I hate that I missed it. It's such an odd film, but Jean Dujardin is amazing <sighs> in the role, and some of the kills in this are just it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. I came out just I was talking to physics about it because he asked me if I was going to go see it again on a second. I was like, Nah, I'm not. I'm not going to see it again because there was other stuff I wanted to see. Because I kept talking to him, I was like. Dude, I dug that fucking movie, man. <laughs> and I was like, maybe I need to go back and rewatch Rubber. I don't know. Yes. Like, <laughs> you do. And watch Keep an Eye Out, which played at last year's Fantastic. That's what Fest. Ashley was saying. They played last year. I think I missed out on that one. I liked it I not as I much saw as that Rubber. One. Yeah. He did that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> so I don't know, man. Like maybe, I, maybe, maybe you I are do, a surrealist. Maybe I do like his brand of yeah. humor. So, but their skin is a lot of fun. All man. right, I dug hmm. that movie. <laughs> All right, I'm looking forward to that one too. Okay, <laughs> wife Dork. Yes. Talk about that one movie. My number one. Yeah. Is also Jojo Rabbit. Yeah. Uh, I gave it five stars at Shit. my first viewing. Huh. I saw it as perfect. I have not gotten to re-see it as of yet, obviously. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> but um, I still, in retrospect, see it as perfect. Mm. Um, was it was it what you expected 
No, it was so much more than I expected. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really just loved watching this story unfold. Mm. I, I just thought it was so beautiful and so thoughtful. What was your favorite aspect of the, of the film? My favorite aspect of the film is the relationship between Jojo and his mother and mm. Scarlett Johansson. Mm. You said I, that this was her, her, her best role? She's absolutely extraordinary in this yeah. movie. It, it was... You, <laughs> she's funny. Mm. She is brave. She is dynamic and heartfelt. And she, get, she, she, it, she just plain gets to do more. She mm. has a lot of range. But at, at the same time is very specific mm. as a mother character. There's, like You haven't seen a mother quite like her. But um, the way her the the way her message as a mother unfolds in Jojo Rabbit is just something that is so perfect. Yeah. And what would you say about Taika Waititi's direction of the the kid who plays Jojo, uh, another child actor? It was interesting. So in the Q and A, he talked about how he cast the children because they are extraordinary. Mm. And he said, mm -hmm. w when you cast children, the trick is not to find the most polished, polished actor. The trick is to find the kid who is that character already and then teach them the lines. Mm -hmm. So the child acting is very natural and very funny. And there are... Like things that the kid says that are like clearly Watiti isms, um, but still play. Uh, I I think that it was both of the kids, the boy and the girl, were really wonderful. Hmm. That's interesting because that's also what director Daniel Scheinert said about casting the child actor in the death of Dick Long, hmm. is that you just find the kid oh, yeah. who's the kid, like who's just you know yeah. being themselves, and then you make a movie around that person's self. Hmm. You know, you don't try to mold them into your character. Hmm. Yeah. But I, I loved Jojo Rabbit. I'm yeah. definitely going to be talking about it in our dorkies. Okay. I just thought it was really wonderful. So instead of talking about Jojo Rabbit, mm -hmm. I don't care that we we're already like two hours long. <laughs> I want to talk about another movie. So I want to talk about Color Out of Space. Uh, of Dolomite space. is my name is my number nine. Color Out of Space is my ten. That's the Stanley... Richard Stanley. Richard Stanley, Richard Stanley movie. movie. Oh, and you like that one? She loved it. I really? loved it. What and it was vomity. So Who it's are you? very <laughs> impressive that I loved it so much. And huh. I think it goes to, like, to me, it just came down to the aesthetic of the movie. Yeah. It's kind of, it's it's based on a short story. By H.P. Lovecraft. By H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft. Of the same title, but there's a U in color instead of. Um, but it's a like War of the Worlds type story. There's a meteorite. Oh, okay, yeah. I'll just say like the blob. It's a little bit like the blob. But a meteorite hits the Earth. Things start coming out of it, and mm. people do things. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but and I don't want to give away the plot, but the visuals that are created by the insertion of this alien thing. That I'm just going to spoil this part. It's a color. <laughs> it's right? a color. The insertion of this color into our world and how it affects the environment is simultaneously super gross and gorgeous. It's like a beautiful, beautiful movie, hmm. visually and disgusting. Hmm. It's complicated. But um, it stars Nicolas Cage. Mm-hmm. Um, he plays a dad. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Gardner. Yep. He's got a wife who is suffering from cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's just trying to deal. They have two... Annoying three, children. Yeah, two annoying children mm -hmm. and then another child. <laughs> Damn. Um, uh, Tommy Chong is in it. Yeah. He yeah, plays yeah, a wise man. So strange. Yeah. Um, there, there was two Chongs in, in Fantastic Fest this year. That's so special. right. That's right. Um, yeah, I, and it's just, I thought it was a really pulpy, melodramatic... I like the film sci -fi a lot. Sci-fi horror film. I hmm. like the film a lot. I didn't like it as much as Lisa liked it. Hmm. Uh, I, I think the some of the dialogue between the cast members is pretty rough. 
mm-hmm. and just didn't work for me. Mm-hmm. But I agree with Lisa. The visuals uh, are striking, and the climax of the movie is incredibly uh, cool. Like mm-hmm. I, I love the ending of the film. Yeah, uh, and I like how you know it, it's it's a Lovecraft film. It's a it's a decent adaptation of the short story, which was the first Lovecraft story I ever read. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's also just a massive Richard Stanley film. Like mm. he puts so much of himself into the Lovecraft narrative, and he specifically addresses some of the problems with Lovecraft in terms of race and gender in the opening scene of Color Out of Space that I really appreciated. Uh, because you know, Lovecraft famously super misogynistic and a racist super racist yeah. and but also a nihilist and a nihilist yeah 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 and, and richard that, stanley is not, is those not that yeah. he is a person who with a lot of heart and a lot of uh true belief in the cosmic yeah and and as much as i love nicholas cage and i think he, he is still turning out amazing performances mm. like mandy um i don't think he necessarily fits what I would want to see from Mr. Gardner in this script. There is a turn in his character that you cannot tell. Like, is this the effect of the color? <laughs> or is he just losing his mind? It mm. seems not rooted in anything. You, you mean, like, is it the effect of... <laughs> is he losing his mind in, because is of the color? Infected? Or is it because it's Nicolas Cage? Yeah. Cranking it C- to 11. Caging it up. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> huh. Okay. That being said, though, I still really enjoyed it. I liked it, too. I, I liked it, too, and I would recommend it. Uh, do I like it as much as Dust Devil? No. Do I like it as much as Hardware? Yes. I think it's better than Hardware. Mm-hmm. I think it's better than his version of Island of Dr. Moreau. Mm-hmm. Duh. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I like his version of Island of Dr. Moreau, too. Mm-hmm. But I love seeing Stanley making movies. Yeah. This movie did win Best Horror. Yeah, Shit. Uh, the festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, was, the response coming out of it was good. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we talked to the guys running the jury yeah. uh, for the horror jury. Yeah. And that's Brian Taylor of Crank Two. Oh yeah. And Jason Trost of the FP. Brian and I cornered them in the bar, yeah. and uh, we were just like, "We we love you. Yeah. We love you." And, and Brian Tyler was great. Brian I mean, he Tyler was, was great. really a yeah. nice guy. And and he he spoiled. The, if it was so great, Brian. How come you haven't told me tales of you canoodling with them at the bar? You're being an asshole friend. What are you about? You're having all these great experiences, and you aren't sharing them with me. Dude, I tried to talk well, to I you. I got to hear about it he, from my other he true friend. He didn't want to make you <laughs> jealous. Yeah. That's bullshit. Here's the thing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Brian and I had a great conversation with the two of them. Uh-huh. It ended with us giving him the It Mod business cards. Uh-huh. We invited them onto the podcast, uh-huh. and uh, they probably threw them away. But whatever, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, it was really beautiful. Yeah, I think yeah. it was probably hard to judge the horror category because there weren't a lot of like so, true horror. Yeah. Films. I, I don't want to like talk out of school for those guys, um, uh, but they were not they were not loving the category of horror this year. Mm. Yeah, mm. I didn't watch a lot of horror films. Well, mm. The horror films I saw, I really liked, including Color Out of Space. Anyway. All right. So what number was Color Out of Space for you, Lisa? Color Out of Space was my 10. So you guys ten. have heard my top 10, because okay. 10 was Color Out of Space, 9 was Dolomite, and yep. then I've talked about all of the other films. Okay. All right. Uh, B, your number one. My number one is technically not a movie. My number one is technically a TV oh, show. Yes, um, yes, yes. But you know what? It was presented as four episodes tied together, yeah. screened late at night. I think it was a nine o'clock showtime. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it plays like a movie. It does. I'm calling it a movie. It's going to be on my dorkies. There you hmm. go. It's Jendi Tartakovsky's Primal. Uh, he is the animator responsible for Dexter's Laboratory. Yep. Um, Samurai Jack, Powerpuff Girls, Powerpuff Girls, Star Wars: The Clone Wars, mm-hmm. uh, the not the CG one, but the two D one mm-hmm. that came out before. And if you haven't seen that one, you should because it's freaking amazing. Brian, I've got those DVDs. I'm gonna give you those DVDs. Oh, for the, what the Star Wars? Yeah, the Star Wars Tartakovsky. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't don't leave without me giving them to you. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, Primal is his best thing in my opinion, and that crowd lost. They're shit watching those four episodes. Yeah. What Primal is, um, it's about a caveman whose family, in the, in the first episode, his, all his family members die. His two kids are killed. His, his wife is By killed. By a dinosaur. By a dinosaur. Oops. So and, he's clearly some kind of crazy Christian. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, and, and he runs across another dinosaur. He's like, you motherfucker. 
Well, his two children, his two dino babies are killed. Her. Oh. Or her, her two dino babies yes. are killed. Thank you. And she's now left alone. And it's about the two of them teaming up and going out into the world, mm-hmm. the prehistoric land, and having adventures together. And it is like, um, you know, I've been doing a lot of comparing of, of movies to movies, but it's like Jack Kirby's Devil Dinosaur and Moon Boy, uh, if it was R-rated and not at all meant for kids, because there are so many arms that get yes. ripped off and heads that get impaled. Oh, it's really violent. It's incredibly violent. Very, very, very bloody. But animation. But animation, yeah. but like yeah. It's gnarly. not like graphic. It's pretty graphic. Um there's some stuff it, that happens. It's pretty pretty amazing. <laughs> they go out into the world and they encounter all kinds of horrors. And, and, it, and it is funny. Like the second episode is actually really funny. Uh, yeah. The two of them competing for food. Yeah, mm-hmm. River river of Snakes. But like, I don't, I, I, again, I don't want to spoil anything that happens in episode three. And I certainly don't want to spoil anything that happens in episode four when it goes full Conan the Barbarian. Oh, gosh. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, uh, when this episode airs to, I, tomorrow night, it, yeah. it, it start. They're gonna show every. They're gonna show it all this week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. From what I'm, I'm gonna, saying, I'm curious to see how it's gonna play As when you individual. Like, episodes. Yeah, if you just watch it in little chunks, because like the first episode, you'll watch it, and I think you'll just go like, "Oh, that's that's kind of cool." Mm-hmm. But the way it progresses, yeah, yeah. Uh, both in character and narrative. So damn good. And we only saw the first four episodes. There's a fifth episode. Yeah. I'm very curious to see how that episode wraps things up. But like, I felt like I saw a whole experience and with those what, four. And that's what it felt like, because the way the fourth episode ends and how when that title card came up, yeah. as that episode ends, and then the crowd just erupts in, the pl- in applause. Well, well like, that's the thing. you know. It, it, it's broken up in those four chapters, and the, each at the end of each one, you know, a new chapter title comes up mm-hmm. and after every chapter title the crowd was applauding yeah like they were just yeah. so invested in this movie yeah hmm. it plays like vignettes but like you say it feels like one complete yeah, story like it, it has there's an anthology quality to it yeah and you can see why like how it would play in episodes yeah but for me it's a full piece of cinematic work it, it and is. it is going to be on my door keys it, it is and like you say not to spoil anything about that fourth episode but that just is insane uh, and like i was even telling you like there's a moment um where it, i had that django unchained yeah. feel uh with like one of the characters and i was just like man this is crazy how he's able to inject this type of characterization with the and he's, and he's done it all the time. And the way you invest in yeah. this crazy caveman and his dinosaur friend. Yeah, yeah, it's so good. It's yeah. so good. Hmm. I had so much fun with that film. Did you bring your print back? The yeah, print I that did. they gave it? I did. How'd you do that? I rolled it up. I had a uh, a a um a, a, dang it, like a, a, a rubber band uh-huh. and I rolled it up and I put it in my my backpack. Man. So we didn't bring our I back. left them at the airport. Mm. Oh, you did? Yeah, because I was going to try to put it in my suitcase, but it was going to get all I could bent. not make it work for my backpack. Yeah. Oh, well. It was a great print. I, dang, I should have brought it tonight. I'll, I'll bring it. I'll bring it. You don't so. have to give it to me. Uh, okay. <laughs> Keep, it. <laughs> Keep it. Keep it. That was cute. Like, you almost had a generous moment, but you, like, uh, slipped it back yeah, in. No, it's an awesome print. It's an awesome, it's awesome print. print. Yeah. It's, it is I great. told Brad that we should just go and ship it back. Well, we should have, but we ran out of time because oh. we were goofing off finding comic book stores on that last Yeah, day. we're having oh. fun in Austin. Okay. Yeah, getting way too drunk at the Death Proof Bar. Yeah, oh. that probably was the thing that was like, I guess we're not going to go to the UPS no. because <laughs> Lisa's wasted and so and mad. I could not drive. <laughs> yeah, um, we ran into some really sweet, fantastic festers at yeah. that bar. And uh, they sent us uh, tequila. tequila shots after we had just done shots of uh, chartreuse. Chartreuse. Because it's death proof. I thought chartreuse would be like, because it's so like, like it's like a liqueur almost. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's like rumple mints or something. Yeah, but it's powerful. But it's like super knocks you on your butt. And I had already ordered a margarita. Whoops. And I'm just like, and I was so mad at Brad. I'm like, I am so drunk right now. Lisa was mm. not happy. I was okay. angry. Anyway, that's the Texas Chili Parlor. Mm. We should all go next time we're in Fantasia. It was super. Definitely. It looks just like the movie. You're uh, like, and they were standing there, and yes. Uh, we our table was where the lap dance occurs. Yeah, nice. yay! 
No la lap dances no. did occur. Lisa, because like I said, Lisa I was way too drunk to even lap dance. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, so Primal. Yeah. It's amazing. It's great. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to check that out this week. Well, I don't know. I kind of want to watch it all. Hearing you talk about it, I kind of want to wait till it all air. I want you to at least, yeah. Like, I just don't want you just to watch the first episode. Because the first episode is... It, it, it's it's the setup. setup. It's the setup that I told well, you. Well, I, I I mean, e even if I watch the first episode tonight, I'm gonna tune in tomorrow and watch the. I'm gonna watch the entirety of it. Yeah. It plays so well together. Okay. I'm curious about that fifth episode. Same. Same. I want to see that fifth episode. Right. So you're gonna be watching it Friday? Yeah, I'm gonna try. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like ten o'clock. Is it Cartoon Network? Yeah, Cartoon, Cartoon Network, Network Adult Swim. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's ten p.m. So I'm definitely gonna check that out. Okay. I'm, I'm, I can't wait. I hope it gets on Letterbox. But like, I want to add it to my. This is why Fantastic Fest is the greatest, yeah. right? Because nowhere else on the planet is that experience available. Yeah, not at you all. You know, it was a full house of screaming, celebrating yeah. maniacs in that theater yeah. who were all like. Yeah, we like Jendi Tartakovsky. We like Samurai Jack. Whoa, my God, what is this? I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so pissed because the Alamos here were showing it like that night that it premiered. They were they had like a, a special oh. engagement, and I was like, I I forgot that it was a it was I forgot that they were showing it, and I now to hear everyone talk about it, I'm I wish I could have fucking oh, seen man, it on the big yeah, screen. Man. Lisa did not love it as much as we did. Mm. Uh, it's all action. Yeah. There's no talking. <laughs> like, literally, crowds were cheering around me, and I fell asleep. Oh, all right. <laughs> so, it was not for me. There's, okay. there's, no, there's, there's talking. It it's just grunting. Yeah. It's yeah. not talking. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, my number one, I'm going to wrap this up uh, for the sake of brevity, because we've already for spoken about it. For the sake of brevity? It's yeah, too I, late. No, but I don't want to drag it out any longer. Uh, but my number one is uh, Takashi Miike's First Love. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for all the reasons that we spoke about earlier um and really outside of that because of the experience of like that particular screening like the audience fucking dug it they didn't know what the hell they were watching i could tell and for uh, quite a bit quite a few people in there it was their first foray into mike that rhymed uh but i could i can't think of a better introductory film for them and hopefully this inspires them to want to check out Fudo. Some other things, <laughs> or yeah, warm vi up to it. Warm visitor Q, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Visitor <laughs> Q. Uh, don't watch Visitor uh -huh. Q yet if, if First Love is your first Mike film. Um, but uh, it, it was a it was a fun watch. Uh, it was very energetic. I want to say that was like at eight that night, eight nine that night, and so this was after a whole day of other people, you know, people watching films, and so this was like a, a shot of adrenaline, you know, to get people, you know, back up and energized and. It was a it was a great it was a great watch uh, and, and, a, and a great film and, and it's nice to see like his his output I mean he is so the term prolific gets thrown around all the time when mentioning him his output is insane but to see the the um, consistency and quality later on in his career I mean you got to think like you said right he has over eighty almost a hundred films like under his belt matter of fact he's got a hundred films under his belt because um, Blade of the Immortal was his hundredth film. That's right. He's made yeah. over 100 movies. This might be his 101, 102 uh, film. Tooth? His 102? Tooth. Tooth? Yeah, 102. <laughs> 200, 102. Uh, <laughs> and for him, and if you just you know take a look back at all of it uh, to see how later on in the, the back half of his filmography, like the, the quality, the consistency of it and him being able to... and But also, like you said, Brad, he's told countless yakuza stories so for someone who's made over 100 film i mean over 100 films and a lot of them <laughs> yeah, like part 40 of, of them. <laughs> be, uh, yakuza films yeah. for him to still be able to find a fresh take on it and it be good and i think that says a lot and it'd be accessible and for someone who makes films like gozu and visited q and you know like i i, I think that speaks to um his innate ability to just tell stories, you know, stories for everyone, you know. So I, I, I found I found that really rewarding. Seeing that trailer, um, I love the trailer, and I was just hoping that the movie would live up to the trailer. I'm glad you dug it, man, because when we came out of that theater on the opening night at Fantastic Fest, it was like, oh my god, 
Darren's gonna love this so much. Yeah, I remember. I remember texting Darren, and because I knew it played, it was gonna play like a couple nights later. And I was like, dude, like the crowd ate. It. I was like, I love this movie. And I was, I was telling him, I was, I hope the Lost Weekend crowd responds the same way. Yeah, that um, so good that it did with us. And yeah. of course they would, because it's a, it's a great, it's a great movie. It's yeah. a great fest movie. Yeah, it is. It is. So thank you, Andy. Uh, and Alamo Drafthouse uh, for okay? screening that film. You're, you really knocked the shit out of your hand. Oh, no, my phone just oh, okay. fell down, and I just slapped my thigh. <laughs> it was a thigh slapper. Um, I just want to thank Andy for programming that, and also not even, not even just programming that film, but uh, Lost Weekend 12 in its entirety. Um, an amazing, amazing accomplishment. The film festival has continued to grow. Uh, the next one I'm looking forward to in the first half of the year, I want to say like February, March time frame. Yeah, March. Um, and from what I'm hearing, it's just going to continue to get bigger. So more movies. I want to say over half of the films that, that were screened this year or at this particular one were uh, advanced screenings. Um, and so he is, you know, he has he has to turn films down now. He's gotten to that point where he has his pick of the litter and he's able to get and curate some wonderful content. So shout out to Andy and Alamo Draft House at Winchester um, for that accomplishment. Thank you. And so, yes, ladies and gentlemen, hit us up on social media at ItModcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, if you went to Lost Weekend or if you went to Fantastic Fest or if you saw any of these films, let us know what you thought about them. Um, you can follow Brian at the Turtle Dork on Twitter, at the Turtle Dork one on Instagram, and at Brian William Young on Facebook. And Wife Dork is at Sidewalk Siren and at Bake Dork on Twitter and Instagram. Brad Gullickson is at Mouth Dork on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Letterbox, and Untapped. And I'm Darren Smith, the Disco Dork on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And can I just say to our listeners? Yep. Head on over to the ItMod Chatcast channel because we spoke to a bunch of filmmakers this year at Fantastic Fest. We yes. spoke to Takashi Miike. We spoke to Bong Joon-ho. Mm -hmm. We spoke to Tim Robbins and his son Jack Henry Robbins about their movie VH Yes, which we didn't talk about, but it's a really interesting movie. Yeah. We spoke to Justin Long. We spoke yeah, we to did. Daniel Shiner. Oh, we spoke to... Um, oh my gosh, just so many people. I think we're going to be having William episodes... Chandler. Oh, yeah, we, the whole cast of VFW, Stephen Lang, William Sadler, Martin Cove, hmm. Jeff Bigos, all going to be on the podcast. For like the rest of the year, you're going to be getting chat cast episodes out of Fantastic Fest. Nice. So please stay tuned for that. Uh, that's going to do it for us. Thank you all for listening. And until next time. <laughs>